Hey guys, here we have the Grade 12 Mathematics Paper 1 exam written in November 2022. 150 marks, three hours long. If you want to download the paper, just check the description below. Excellent, let's begin. Here we have two solve for x questions. So whenever they have something like this, where you've just got two brackets next to each other, I'll give you some scenarios. Let's say you have x minus two, x plus one equals to three. Because this number is not a zero, what I would tell you to do in that type of scenario is I would tell you to multiply these two brackets together. So that would give you x squared um, plus x minus 2x minus 2. And then you'd bring the 3 over and then make a zero. Then you would combine all of the like terms together. And then I would tell you to factorize this, either using um, the formula or if it factorizes. I don't think this one factorizes very nicely. So you would use the quadratic formula. But the point is, is that you need this number to be a zero. And here we have a zero, but you first want all of the like terms to be combined like we have over here. Okay, so that's what I would do if this number is not a zero, okay? But if that number is a zero, for example, um, or let me show you another example, x squared minus 3x minus 4 equals to zero. If you have a situation like this, you could use the quadratic formula or you could factorize. This one would factorize as x minus 4 and x plus 1. And when you have brackets like this, what would you do? Well, you would say x minus 4 equals to zero or x plus one equals to zero. You see, so when you have brackets and it's equal to zero, then you just make the two brackets equal to zero. So here we have a bracket and a bracket and it's equal to zero. So you're just gonna take each bracket. I'm sorry guys, I know most of you probably know this very well, but just in case. Okay, x plus two equals to zero. And so you could say three x minus six. Well, okay, if you can't just write the same thing, my dude. So you're gonna take the six over, three x equals to six. Divide both sides by 3, and so x would be 2. And then if you solve this one, you're going to end up with x equals to negative 2. And so your two answers will be x equals to negative 2, and x would equal to positive 2. With this one over here, don't waste your time trying to factorize. Why? They said correct to two decimal places. The fact that we use, we're going to get decimal places tells us that it's a quadratic formula kind of question. So here we have the quadratic formula. And so remember... The a value is always the one in front of the x squared. So a would be 2. The b value is always the number in front of the x. So b would be negative 6. And then the rest of it would be c. And what's really important is that you have a 0 there. Okay, if there was not a 0 there, then you would first have to take a whole lot of stuff to the one side, make the other side equal to 0, then you can use or get your a, b, and c. Okay, it must be equal to zero. So now we're just going to go fill this into the formula. So you're going to end up with x equals to, well, let me write it over here, x equals to negative. Now you see that, now don't make a mistake here. There's a negative there, but then the b is also a negative. So you're going to have something like that. Okay, you can put it in a bracket if you want to. You don't have to. But where you should put a bracket is for the b squared. So put a negative six. If you do it like this, you're actually going to get it wrong. It's not going to work out. You must put that one in brackets. That one is important. So um, minus 4, now a is 2 and c is 1. You can use brackets for all of them if you want. Some learners forget to put anything here. So on their calculator, it just looks like that. You need to have a plus or a minus in between. Okay, otherwise you're probably going to get, uh, maybe you'll get an answer, but it won't be correct. Or you're going to get an error on your calculator. And then here you're going to put a, which is 2. Now, on the memos or in the exam, you don't need to simplify this any further. You can literally go write it like that on your calculator. I know in some schools, the teachers tell you you have to use, you have to go work all of this out. It's silly, guys. They don't ask that in the final exams. Um, you can literally just go type this all on the calculator now. Just make sure to type it all in exactly as you see it. So I'm busy doing that now as we speak. First answer. 2.82, now it's said to two decimal places, 2.82, and then your other answer would be just where you change the plus to a minus, for example, um, over here. Okay, and that one is 0 0.18, 0 0.18. And then in between here we should be saying or. So x equals to 2.82 or 
x equals to 0 0.18. Here we have an inequality. So with an inequality, well, with any x, for example, if I have x squared minus 3x equals to 5, what would step 1 be? Take everything to the one side so that the other side is a 0. If you had something like x minus 1, x plus 3 equals to 6, what you would do here, you would multiply these brackets out, take the 6 over, put all the like terms together, and then make a zero on the one side. So we like to have a zero. We have to have a zero on the one side whenever we have something more than just a normal x. Okay, we have to have a zero. So that's going to be step one. We're going to make a zero. So I'm going to bring this one over. There we go. We have our zero. That's what we want. Now we can uh, try to factorize this. So 90. Well, 90 is the same as, okay, I thought of one already, but let's just go through some options. 2 times 45, 3 times 30, uh, blah, 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 blah. 10 times 9. 10 times 9 is what would work. So you could use the quadratic formula if you wanted to, but if we factorize this, we're going to end up with um, x, uh, how would this work? x minus 10, and then x plus 9. And you can double check it. For example, x times x is x squared. Um, 9x minus 10x. So 9 minus 10 equals negative 1x. And that's what I did over there. Okay, so that's just a normal factorizing that I did there. But as I said, you could use the quadratic formula. Right, now, when you, now, now don't go and solve this. What a lot of learners do. What I'm about to show you now is wrong. What I'm about to show you now is wrong. What some learners do is they now think that this is the same as this. And then, well, no, they just, sorry, they just do this. They go x minus 10 bigger than 0 or x plus 9 bigger than 0. Because that's what you would have done if this was equal to 0. But we don't do that with inequalities. With inequalities, what we are now going to go and do is you are going to go and work out your critical values. Your teacher might not have called it that exactly, but maybe. Most teachers do. So critical values. So to work out your critical values, you're going to make each of these two brackets equal to zero. Okay. And like this is something that you do on the side of your paper. So you could say x is equal to 10 and x is equal to minus 9. Now those are not answers at all. All that, the, oh, now, okay, now there are two different ways that you could solve an inequality. I've showed two different ways over the years of my videos and over the years of teaching. And I'm going to show both of them to you guys now. So method number one is to do the, um, like this. You're going to take a number line. Okay, and you're going to put those numbers on the number line in the correct order. So not, minus 9 would be more to the left and 10 would be more to the right. Now we've got three different intervals on our number line. Okay, this is the method I used to show in the very beginning um, when I first started uh, making videos and teaching. These days I use the parabola method, but I'm going to show you the parabola method now. I've also got videos on that, but I'll show both in this lesson, okay? So, um, or in this video. So, uh, what we can see now, okay, so we've got three different intervals. Now, what I want you to do is start in interval A and choose any number you like over here. Well, it can be any number to the left of minus 9. So, I'm going to choose minus 100, okay? And you're going to go and put minus 100 into this expression. You could put it, sorry, you could put it here or you could put it here because can we agree that mathematically this and this is actually the same thing because if you had to multiply this, you still get that. So they're the same thing. So you can choose whatever you want. I'm going to go put it over here. So I'm going to go on my calculator and wherever I see a X, I'm going to put a bracket like that and I'm going to plug minus 100 into that bracket. It's very important that there's a bracket, okay? Now, what you'll get don't worry about what your answer is. Just see, is your answer a positive number or a negative number? Well, if you've done it correctly, you're going to get a positive number. Okay. For those of you that want to know what the number is to make sure that you just have a bit of peace of mind, uh, 10,010. So um, it would have given you 10,010. But I don't care what the number is. I just want to know, is it positive or negative? Okay. Now I move on to interval B. And in interval B, I choose any number that fits in between here. So any number between minus 9 and 10, I'm going to choose 0. So I'm going to go plug 0 into this same equation over here. 
I'm gonna just plug in a zero. If I type that on my calculator, I end up with negative 90. So that's a negative number. So I just put a negative number there. I don't care what the number is. For C, I'm gonna choose positive 100. So I go and I put positive 100 over there. And if I work that out, I don't really care if it's a positive, I mean, if it's a, what the number is. I just wanna know is it positive or negative, And I get 9,810. That doesn't matter. All I care about is it's positive. Right, now, they, what they're telling you is that this expression over here, or you can think of it as this one, they're telling you that it's positive whenever x is one of these numbers, any number over here. If x is any number over here, then the expression will be negative. And if x is any number over here, then the expression will be positive. So what do they want us to do? They said, where is this expression bigger than zero? Now think about numbers that are bigger than zero. Now this is where a lot of students get confused. They say, oh, so it's bigger than zero. Oh, here's a zero. So does that mean my answer is gonna be all of this? No, that's not what they mean, guys. They wanna know where is this entire expression bigger than zero? Now bigger than zero means positive, right? If a number is bigger than zero, it means positive. So then what you do is you look on this number line and you see where are the positive parts. They're not saying where's the positive numbers. They're saying where are the positive intervals that we found. Well, we found out that this interval was a positive. You see the plus over there, that means positive. And this interval was a positive. You see the plus, that's what we found. So our answers are gonna be this interval or this interval, okay? It's got nothing to do with Oh, look at those numbers which are positive or negative. No, not, not at all. It's got to do with the signs that we found over there. Aha. So what we now do is we say, okay, so X can be any number over here. So X can be any number that is larger than 10. X can be any number larger than 10, like 11, 12, 13. Or X could be any number over here. So whenever you go left on a number line, that means smaller. So we could say X is smaller then minus nine, and that is the answer, okay? Now, let me show you my second method, which is a method I use more often nowadays, but I use both depending on what I feel like doing in the moment, but I'll show you both. So here comes the second method I could use. Oh, but first I forgot about all of my interval notation students. So for the students who want interval notation, for X is bigger than 10, you could say X is an element. Um, now to be bigger than 10, you would go from 10 all the way to infinity. And then you could say, or, and then we going X is smaller than minus nine. So you would go, if a number is smaller than minus nine, it goes all the way from negative infinity, all the way up to negative nine. That is how you could write the answer with interval notation. Okay, let me show you method number two now on how to solve this. Okay, so let's quickly erase. The first part's all the same. Even the critical values is the same. So this would be method number two. You're still going to make a number line and you're still going to put the numbers minus nine and ten. Now, you're going to make a parabola. Now you have two options. You're either going to make a happy parabola. See the smiley face? or a sad parabola, sad face. Now you can't just choose whichever one you feel like. What you gotta do is this. Look at this expression here. Is that a happy parabola or a sad parabola? Well, Kevin, how am I supposed to know, my dude? Well, remember, you look at the number in the front of the x squared. If the x squared is a positive number, then it's smiling, positive, I'm happy, I'm positive. If this number in the front of the x squared is a negative, then I'm sad, I'm negative. Whoops, smiley face, the eyes are there. Negative, sad, positive, happy, makes sense. So um, if we look at this x squared, it's a positive number. So we're gonna draw a smiley face going through those two points. No need for any y axis or anything like that. Okay, now we still got intervals. The two methods I'm showing are actually the same thing. So here we've got one area, which I would call area A. Let's actually highlight that like that. Then we've got area B. Let's highlight that like that. And then we've got area C. And let's do that in green. Oh, what's going on there? Oh, okay, interesting. There we go. 
some of the art nerds are like, yeah, bro, you can't do like primary colors on top of each other, bro. It will just fade out. No, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe PowerPoint is acting weird. Okay, so um, let's have a look. What was I going to say? Okay, so what you do now, it's very, I like this technique, but it's, a, it's, a, it's the same as the number line method I just showed you, but it's just looking at it differently. So when the graph is above the x-axis like that, so this area here, that is when the graph is considered to be positive. It's got nothing to do with these numbers. Those are just the X numbers. When they say, where is a graph positive, they mean above. Where is the graph above or where is the graph below if it was smaller than zero? Okay, that's all it is. So in this area here, we can see the graph is above the X axis. So that is called a positive area. Here we can see the graph is underneath the X axis. That is called a negative area because it's below. Here we are above again, above. So we are positive. So they said, where is this happy parabola? Because it's positive over there. Where is it bigger than zero? Where is it above? That means above. It has as I said, nothing to do with these numbers. We're not looking at those numbers being negative or positive, okay? So let's take out all these fancy drawings that I've done here. Okay, so we wanna know where is it above being uh, a bigger than zero positive. So it's this area over here and this area over here. So once again, for this area over here, we will say it's where all the values of x are smaller than minus nine, Okay, or it's all of these areas here where x is bigger than 10. There we go. For my interval notation, people would say x is an element going from negative infinity to negative 9, or from positive 10 up to infinity. So there we have two different methods giving us the same result, of course, but just two different ways of looking at it. So there are two main ways that we could do a question like this. And I'll show you both methods. Okay, so, and, and we will get to the same answer. That's the beautiful part of maths. So I think, no, let's actually divide the page like this. Okay, so in method one, no, let's divide it the other way. Makes more sense. Okay, method number one, and then this would be method number two. So the first method is to see this as a square root equation. You know, when you have equations like x minus one, um, minus x, whoa, what's going on there? Minus x equals to two. That's a square root equation. So you should know what we do with square root equations. We always get the square root by itself, step one. So step one here, I'm gonna try to get the square root by itself. The seven is okay, that can stay. Um, even the negative seven is okay. So we're gonna keep that, that part, that term, keep that together. So we're gonna call this the square root equation. And this one here is actually gonna be a K method kind of thing. Okay, we'll show you now. So um, this, is the, this is the more popular option, but if you are a student who does K method, then we can look at that now. Okay, so we're gonna take the X over so it becomes negative. Okay, so we have the square root term by itself. That's all that we needed. Now we square both sides. Remember, I've made videos on this before where we've spoken about this. You get the square root by itself, then you square both sides. Mathematically, you are allowed to do that. As long as you do it to both sides, then it's, it's perfectly acceptable. Okay, now, when you square this part over here, um, you're gonna square the negative seven. So, on, so what is negative seven multiplied by negative seven? That becomes positive 49. Okay, let's make it over there rather. Now, what is this squared? Well, what is square root x times another square root x? I don't know how you like to do that, but you should eventually work out that that is just going to give you x, okay? If you want me to just show you, square root x multiplied by square root x is the same as square root x squared, and then that just becomes x. Okay, and then on this side, please be careful here. A lot of students, even in grade 12, you're sometimes still making the mistake of you take... You just take this number and you square it, and then you take this and you square it. But you've got to do double brackets, okay? Like that. That's what you want to do. 
And now we're going to say uh, 49x equals. Now you're going to go multiply and you're going to go do all the bracket bracket stuff. Um, you should eventually end up with that over there. Okay. After you've combined and done all your stuff. So you will eventually rock up with, or well, that doesn't sound right. You're not going to rock up with an answer. Well, I guess you could, but yeah, you rock up to your matric ball, but you don't rock up with your maths answer. <laughs> it's a bit weird, Kev. Um, okay, so 144 uh, plus 24x plus x squared. That's what you should get after you've done everything and you've combined and all of that good stuff. Okay, now we are back to an easy question where we just have a, um, we're, we're just going to do normal trinomial. So we're going to take this over to the one side. Kevin, don't we have to always take everything to the left? Guys, that's so like 10 years ago. We, you must understand that you can, I know back in the days your teacher always took everything to the left or most teachers do that, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can if you want to, but you can take things to the left or the right. It doesn't matter. As long as you end up with a zero on one of the sides, you're good. So take the 49x over. There we go. As I said, you could have taken all of this to that side. It's also okay. If you're comfortable with that, no problem. Um, this, what would that give us? I need my calculator. I don't want to make any small mistakes. Negative 25 plus 144. Okay, here you can try to factorize. If you're really struggling in a test and you just can't get it, just use the quadratic formula. I would do the same, to be honest. But for interest sakes, I went and had a look now and um, I was just messing around in my calculator. 16 multiplied by nine is the factors you could have used. But to be honest, I wouldn't have done it in a test if I was you. I would have actually just used the quadratic formula. You know, x equals negative b plus minus uh, b squared minus 4ac over 2a. So then you would go plug everything in. So um, this would be your a, b would be negative 25, and then this would be your c value. So you would, I'm just running out of space, but you would go fill all of that in, okay? And you would end up with x is 9, or uh, what's this other one? x is 16. Now, that would get you almost full marks for that question, but I want you to just remember whenever there's a square root involved, um, or there's some type of fraction with the x at the bottom, you should always do like a little check just to make sure everything's okay. So what I'll do is I will go and take this x equals to nine, and I'm just gonna go plug it into this equation. So nine minus seven, square root of nine. I'm just gonna go type that on my calculator. Gave me negative 12. So that's perfect, that looks okay. Then I'm gonna go check the 16, let's just check that one out. So 16 minus seven times square root 16. These teachers are sly foxes, so they usually make one of them not work. Oh, it also is negative 12. To be honest, I don't see that happening too many times. So in this scenario, you have both of your answers valid. Okay, if you are happy with that, method, then don't even waste your time worrying about this. But if you are a learner that doesn't really like that method, then I will, um, then I'll show you the K method. The K method won't always, the K method doesn't always work for square root equations. It was only this one where I saw something that could be quite useful. So check this out. We know that square root X is the same as X to the half right? Because of just exponent rules and things like that. Ex example, if you have x a 3 and a 5 over here, then we know that it's x to the 3 over 5. So if you have just an x, we know that there's actually the number 1. And over here, we actually have the number 2. And so that would be x to the 1 over 2. And that's what I did over there. Okay, cool. So now let's move on. And then that's going to be equal to negative 12. I'm going to then bring the negative 12 over. So it'll become a positive 12. And you should identify that this is a trinomial. Uh, Kiev, no, it's not, Brood. Doesn't it have to only be x squares with x's? Because that's what we've always done it like. Guys, remember, we have actually done questions since like grade, uh, like maybe, yeah, mostly grade 11, not grade 10, grade 11, grade 12. Um, we, well, in grade 11, we would have done this quite a bit where we identify where well, we had special kinds of trinomials where you could have, for example, x to the 4 minus 7x squared plus 12 or x to the 6 minus 7x3 plus 12 or x minus 7x to the half plus 12. A trinomial 
by the way, is whenever this exponent is double that exponent. That is actually what a trinomial is. So what we're so used to is trinomials that look like this, right? Because that's a two and that's a one. So because it's double, we call it a trinomial. So remember that a trinomial is not only your x squared and your x like we're so used to. I know that that's very popular, but this over here is a trinomial because this exponent is a one and a one is double a half. Aha. So what you then do if you don't want to work with these ugly fractions and stuff is you just say the following. Let the smaller one, which is the x to the half, just replace that with k. Okay, then this is going to become k squared. Let me explain, because I know that that might not be super, uh, for some of you, you might be like, oh yes, I understand, but let me show you. I can replace this as x half with a 2 on the outside here, because what is that? If you multiply those two, what do you get? You get a 1. Ah, so I can just put it, I can rewrite that term as that over there, yeah? And then this I can just keep like that, and then like that. But now k is x to the half. So we could say k squared minus 7k plus 12. Now this is a trinomial that we feel more comfortable with. And so we can go and factorize this one very nicely as k minus 4, k minus 3. Make sure you understand and you get what I'm getting there. And so if you had to solve, you'd end up with k is 4, k is 3. Why are we getting different answers? Because these are the k values. We haven't yet got the x values. So what we now go and do is we go substitute back. So we know that x to the half is k. So we could say x to the half is equal to 4 for the first one, or x to the half is equal to um, 3 for that one. Now what we do is we are just going to try to get rid of that half by squaring both sides because that 2 and that half, if you multiply them, it just becomes a 1. And then we're going to do the exact same over here. And so what happens is that this just side just becomes x. So I'm going to write here x equals, and then this becomes 16. Oh, look at that. Okay, and then for this one, we're going to multiply those two again. And so x equals 9. And there we get our two answers. Good stuff, guys. Solve for x and y simultaneously. Now, if you've watched my simultaneous videos, you'll see I follow pretty much the same procedure every single time. Step one. Choose the most simple equation and get x or y alone. Okay, now both of these are pretty simple, to be honest, but this is more simple. So I'm going to take this equation. I'll call that equation number one. I'll call that equation number two. I'll take equation number one, and I'm going to rearrange it to try get x or y alone. I'm going to go for y. Why? <laughs> because there's a 2 in the front here, and I don't want to be dividing by 2. I don't want any weird fractions, okay? Life is challenging as it is. I don't need fractions in my life. Thank you very much. So <laughs> we're going to take this one over here, and we're going to try get this y by itself. So I'm going to take this y over to that side, and then I'm going to take the 2 over. There we go. You see how we now have the y by itself? Call that equation number three. Take that equation and plug it into the equation that we haven't used. So we have not used number two. So we're going to say substitute number three into number two. So look carefully. It says that y is, that's what equal means, it means is 2x minus 2. So I can take this y away and I can replace it by what it is. It's 2x minus 2. So I could have that. Pause there if you need to and make sure you understand what I've just done. Okay? Now, everything's easy. We just multiply the x into the brackets. 2x squared minus 2x equals 4. Now we have a trinomial. But to make it a trinomial, we need to get a 0. 
there we go. Now you could factorize right over here, you could use the quadratic formula right over here. I want to divide everything by two, but you don't have to. Now, the only reason I'm doing that is because it's just gonna be easier to work with. I can divide this by two, I can divide this by two, I can divide this by two, and I can divide that by two. So that's gonna become x squared minus x minus two equals to zero. Okay, I don't think this one, oh no, this one will factorize, but if you don't feel like factorizing, just use the quadratic formula. Okay, but this one will factorize as x minus two and x plus one. Okay, make sure you agree with me on that. X equals to two or x equals to negative one. Now that's not the answer, the question said solve for x and y. Okay, so what you now do is you just go back to, you could technically go back to number one, number two, or number three. I always go back to number three because y is already by itself. So, so if x is two, then y would be equal to, um, I could say two times uh, two, which is the value of x minus two, and so y is two. Then for x equals to negative one, I could say two times negative one minus two, and so y would be negative four. Ah, one of these questions. You always know that like in an exam, in question one, there's always these ones. It's usually 1.3. Luckily, this one's only three marks, but some of them can get quite weird, and you gotta gauge, like, look, if you're a student who's aiming for 50%, don't waste time. Have a look at the question. If it's something that you could think of maybe doing, maybe you could get one or two marks, go for it. But if it's something that just looks, if you read it the first time and you're a student who gets 50s or 60s and you look at it and you're just like, no, then just literally move on to the next question because this type of question can waste so much time. They're not nice questions. If you're a student that's aiming for 85 or 90%, well then of course you probably have to give every question a go. But if you're literally a student who's getting in the 40s, 50s, um, 60s, and that's realistically where you are aiming for, then be clever with what questions you do. You don't have to go and try every single question. That's just not you don't need to do that. I'm not saying leave out a whole bunch of questions, but especially ones like this. If you look at it and you have, and it just looks weird, then skip, okay? So it's, it's a, you look, success in maths is a balance between having enough, you know, knowing the work and then also having enough time to do it. So if you're gonna destroy your time on this question, yeah, you're probably gonna be worse off than if you just skip and lose the three marks, okay? So show that this ugly expression is even for all positive integers. Like if you read that and you just like, Mabru, what are we even talking about here? Then just go to the next question, okay? I'll be honest, when I look at this, I'm, I'm thinking that as well. I'm also thinking, um, yeah, okay, uh, should we skip? <laughs> but yeah, like, yeah, I mean, I guess I have to do it, otherwise this video would be pretty awkward, eh? Okay, show, like, if, imagine, guys, I'm just like, guys, I think I'm gonna skip this one. Um, I don't feel like doing this one, it looks a bit weird. That wouldn't be great, eh? Okay, so show that this is even for all positive integer values of n. Okay, so we wanna show that this thing is positive. Now, how can we show that something is positive? Well, uh, well, let me go along, let me go along and see what we can do here. So, mm, I think what we could do is, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split this one and I'm gonna split this one. So let's have a look here. And by the way, this is not 2.5. It's two multiplied by five to the n. So Kevin, why can't we just make this a 10? No, guys, you cannot multiply a two and a five and make it a 10. But Kevin, two times five is 10. Yeah, but this isn't two times five. This is two times five to the N. We don't know what N is. N could be any number. So this is not five. So you cannot multiply these two together. Trust me, they would have done it if they knew they could. Um, they wouldn't ask to split the question up like that. Okay, now we're gonna split this up. So you need to know that this can split into five to the N and five to the one. Uh, Kev, how does that work? Okay, let me show you. So if you have a to the three and a to the two, what does that become? If you say a five, that is correct. How did you do that? You said a three plus two, you added them. So what I'm doing is I'm saying that when it's written like that, you can break it up into its individual parts. See, so five to the n plus one can be written as that and that. Okay, and then I'm gonna do it over here. The reason I did that is so that, 
Um, oh no, that's not what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to do. So what I'm going to now do is realize that, oh wait, check here guys. This is 25, so I'm going to write that as, tw let's do that in the next step. So 2 times 5n minus 5n times 5 plus 5 times, sorry, 5n times 25. So look here, we've got two of the, we've got two 5n's. Here we've got 5 five n's and here we've got 25 five n's so let's just say we've got two five n's minus five five to the n's plus 25 five to the n's so it's it's it's, it's exactly the same as saying we have 2x minus 5x plus 25x you can just combine all of that together now because they are all like terms so 2 minus 5 is negative 3 Let's write that better. 2 minus 5 is negative 3. Negative 3 plus 25 is 22. So it's 22 times 5 to the n. Now they're saying, show that that thing, which is now this thing over here, is even, geez, like, for all positive integer values of n. Okay, well, let's just go do some testing here. So let's see positive integer values of n. Let's break that down into baby steps. Positive. Numbers that are positive, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, you know, positive numbers. What about 1.5? Well, it is positive, but it's not an integer. Kevin, what is an integer? Integers are numbers that are um, negative and positive, but they, they, like, they don't have decimals. So it's numbers like this. Okay, no decimals, nothing weird like that. So they want only the positive ones of those. So scratch out the zero and all the negative ones. So they want you to, they saying for any value of these, and it could obviously go on seven, eight, nine, ten, up to 100 billion gazillion, it doesn't really matter. Now, something I'm gonna do, let me first do it. I'm gonna quickly break this number up into two times 11, right? Because two times 11, and then I'm gonna just write it differently. Okay, now, this number two is very important in mathematics. If you take the number two and multiply it with any, any positive uh, or any number, it's always going to be an even answer. For example, if I multiply it by three, I get six. That's even. If I multiply it by four, I get eight. That is even. If I multiply it by three, oh, we've done that one, Kev. If you do it by five, you get 10, that is even. If you multiply it by seven, that's 14, it is even. So, if you multiply the number two with any integer number, like three, four, seven, five. I'm not saying you must go multiply it with decimals and things like that. You get an even answer, okay? Now, if you look at this expression over here, you could play around with that a bit, but like it says that make sure that this expression is even for all positive integer values of n. So positive integer values of n. So n you could put, like we said, you could put the number one, the number two, the number three, the number four, the number five, whatever. Let's test it out a bit. If you put the number one, this would give you 110, even. If you put the number two, okay, now I need my calculator, you're gonna get 550. Even. Why? Because you are taking the number 2 and you are multiplying it by a normal number over here. And this no this number over here is always going to be something positive and it's not going to have any decimals because they've told us just to use positive integer values of n. So this thing's no never going to go decimal or go weird or anything like that. So this answer that we get inside here is always going to be an integer value. It's not going to be a decimal. So we could say that 2, you could literally write this for them. You could say 2 multiplied by any integer will give a uh, even, sorry, a even answer. And that's it. That is how you would do this question. Um, we're just showing that this ugly thing here is the same as that. 
and or better better let's do that okay but as i said these questions if they're giving you a headache in the exam and you're a student that's just aiming for 40 50 60 don't waste your time if you're a student that wants 90 or 100 percent um or 80 percent then yeah you probably have to put a bit of effort into that one okay and try see if you can get one two maybe even three marks when i look at a question like this I don't have a clear map of what I'm going to do. But what I think we could try is, okay, what I notice is that this number, these two numbers multiplied together gives us that number. So that's a start, I guess. So we could say something like, like if you thought, hey, this is two to the five, it is, it might work. We might have to do it like that, but I'm just seeing something different right now. I'm just seeing 96 to the X as, 3 to the x, well, let me first show it like this, 3 multiplied by 32, right? Because that's 96. 3 multiplied by 32 to the x. Now, this x can go to the to the 3 and the 32. Remember, if you have something like uh, x, y to the 3, then that becomes x to the 3 because you multiply these two, and then y to the 6 because you multiply those two. So that 3 goes to both. So this x goes to both. So there's a little 1 over there. So you could say uh, 3 to the y plus 1 over 32 equals um, square root of 3 to the x and uh, 32 to the x. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take these out of the square root. So you know, for example, if you have x to the 7, then you need to know that that is the same as x to the power of this number over this number. Now, if there's no number there, then it's a 2. So I'm going to do that over here as well. So we're going to have 3 to the y plus 1 over 32 equals to 3 to the x over 2 and then 32 to the x over 2. Okay, what we could now do is, I'm going to bring this 32, which currently has an exponent of a 1. This is not a nice question, it's quite tricky. I'm going to bring that 32 up, so it becomes negative 1. Okay, you'll see why I'm doing that now. Okay, so for this side to be the same as this side, it means that this part will, what we can see is that this part and this part is already the same. So, and then this part and this part's the same. So what we need to then make sure, or what we need to try to do is make this the same as that, and we need to make this the same as that. Then these two sides are equal. So we want to say that y plus 1 must be the same as x over 2. And minus 1 must be the same as x over 2. Okay. So... I would start at, this is your equation 1, this is your equation 2. You don't have to do a simultaneous because if you look at this equation, you could get x completely alone. You could multiply the minus 2 over to that side. So x would be equal to negative 2. Then you could use that x answer in this equation. So y plus 1. Yo, this is quite an interesting question, I won't lie. Um, like that. And so y plus 1 is equal to negative 1. And so y is equal to negative 1, take away 1. And so y is negative 2. And there are other ways you could have done these questions, like some learners would have changed this to a 2 to the 5, and the 96 would have had a 2 to the 5. Let me actually show you um, one other way. But for those of you that are satisfied with what we've done, then of course you can move on to the next video. So, some other ways we could have done this. We could have gone 3y plus 1. Then this number here, you could use your shift fact method on your calculator. Just break that thing all the way down. And then you could break this number up as well. 
Now, if you shift fact 30, I mean 96, 96 equals shift uh, fact where you fact there. Uh, ah, shift fact. Okay, so we could write it as 2 to the 5 times 3, but then in a bracket with an x. Okay, now we're going to follow the same strategy that we used earlier. So we're going to go like this, and then we're going to go... And we're gonna do exactly what we did earlier. So I'm gonna distribute the x to there and to there. Remember there's a little one there. So it'll become two to the five x and three to the one x, or just x if you like. Now, remember there is a little two over there, so we could go, um, you could even square both sides if you wanted to. That would also work. Let's Maybe let's do that. I think you guys would like that. So let's square both sides. There's multiple ways. So we're gonna square and Square. So that 2 will distribute to the y plus 1 and to the 5. So it'll become 3 to the 2y plus 2. Remember, this 2 goes to both of those, okay? And at the bottom, you're going to have 2 to the 10. Here, you're just going to have everything besides the square root. So 2 to the 5x and 3 to the x, because this 2 cancels out the square root. Right, now here I can see there's a 3 and a 3, and then there's a 2 and a 2, but I don't like the fact that this 2 is at the bottom, so I'm going to bring that, that, that guy up. So let's go up here, and then we do that. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is realize that, okay, these two parts are the same, and these two parts are the same. So the only way that we can make the left and right equal is if this part is the same as that part. So 2y plus 2 equals x. And then this part is the same as that part. Now our equations are different, but you'll see we'll get to the same answer. So I'm going to use this equation to get x so long. So x would be negative 2. I'm then going to take that and plug it into here. So we end up with 2y plus 2 equals negative 2. And so 2y is equal to negative 2 take away 2, which is just negative 4. And then I'm going to divide by 2, and we get the same exact answers. Quite a good question, that one. Quite a nasty one, to be honest. The first term of a geometric series... Ooh, series, okay, that's interesting, is 14, and the sixth term is 448. Calculate the value of r for, the, for only two marks. Okay, so what we can do is we can use, uh, they're saying that the sixth term, so when, we, when we're talking about a specific term, you're not going to use this formula. They not, they, I know they said a series over there, which is that over there, but within that question, they're saying that the sixth term, so we use the TN formula for geometric, which is this one over here, and they're saying that it has a value of 448, okay, um, A, R, and then N is the sixth term, so that's five. But now they said that the first term is 14, so A is the first term, so that's 14, so I can just do that. There we go. Now I'm going to divide both sides by 14, and we get 32. Okay, now you could use logs here, or you could use the shift fact on your calculator, shift fact of 32, and what you would find is that's 2 to the 5. There we go. So these two top parts are already the same. So the only way that this side and this side can be equal is if the bottom parts are the same. Therefore, R must be 2. So r is 2. This next question is just worded in a weird way, but it's actually very easy. It just says, determine the number of consecutive terms that must be added to the first six terms of the series in order to obtain a sum of that. Now, you can actually ignore... You can say, uh, determine the number of terms of the series in order to do that. Let's do that part first, and then I will come back and explain how to modify our answer, okay? So they're just saying the sum is 114674. So because there's the sum, we've got two different formulas you may choose. You could choose whatever you like. You can choose this one, or you could choose um, where you put the R's first. So you either put the R's first, or you put the 
ones first. Students always ask me, yeah, but sir, doesn't it make a difference which one we choose? My teacher said we should, no, nope, blah, 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 blah. Uh, just choose any one of those that you like. Okay. So um, I'm going to just choose this one. What is wrong is if you put a 1 minus R at the top and an R minus 1 at the bottom. Keep it the same. That's correct. Okay, they said that the sum uh, is that. So you say 1, 1, 4, 6, 7, 4. A, we already found out was 14. R, we already found out as 2. N, we don't know. There we go. Okay, now... What I would do here is I would just say 1 minus 2, which is negative 1. So we could say 1, 1, 4, 6, 7, 4 equals to that over that. I would then multiply this number to there and divide this number down there. So you're going to end up with 1, 1, 4, 6, 7, 4 multiplied by negative 1 over 14. And then on the right, we're just going to be left with that. I would then go ahead, type that on my calculator. And that gives negative 8191. Okay, now you can do this however you like, but I'm going to bring this to that side, and I'm going to bring that to that side. So we end up with 2 to the n equals to 1 plus 8191, and so we end up with 2 to the n equals to 8192. Shift fact, you this can shift fact this one, or you could use uh, logs, if you and logs are like having a thing, or I don't know, if maybe that's your thing, we go for it. No judgment here. I'm just more of a shift fact kind of guy. So 2n is equal to 2 to the 13, and therefore n would be 13. Now that's not the answer, but we're very close. So what that tells us is that there are 13 terms to be able to have an answer of that. So it just says here, how many terms must we add to the first six terms? Well, if there's 13 terms altogether, then if they've already counted the first six, well then we'll just add another seven terms. So we can just say now, 13 minus 6 must be 7 extra terms that we need to add. And there are other ways you could have done that question, okay? So this question says, if the first term of another series is 448 and the sixth term is 14, calculate the sum to infinity of the new series. Okay, so this question has absolutely nothing to do with that. Oh, wait, it does. I mean, maybe. Because that's, here they're saying the first term is 14. But uh, do we need to know? Um, I think, okay, wait, let me just erase this. Yeah, because then you see we don't have the R value. Okay, so the, this this one was, the first term was 14. And then the R value was, what was the R value for this one? It was 2. So that means 28 times by 2 is 56, times by 2 is 112, 224, and then 448. That's what that term was. That was the original. Now this new one has a first term of 448. Ah, so it's just going to go down. You see? So that's so 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 what is the r value? Well the r value is always this number divided by this number. So two two four. Don't say negative two or something like that. It's actually gonna be a half. Okay, so the r value is a half. So we can use the sum to infinity formula now. So a would be not this a. A is now for this sequence, which is four forty eight. R of this sequence is a half. See, here the R value is 2 because you're going from 14 to 28 to 56. So you're multiplying. Here you're multiplying by a half because the numbers are getting smaller. Okay? And so if you had to go work this out, uh, it's going to end up doubling. So you're going to get 896 as your final answer. Don't get a fright. When you look at these questions, don't get a fright. Just watch this. Okay? Let's see what we're going to do here. Now, when I look at this, I also think, wow, it looks weird. But let's just see how this goes. So it says, if this ugly expression is equal to that, now here's where learners make their first mistake. Mistake number one, 
they think that this is an equation. So they make these two things equal to each other. They say this part, I see this mistake all the time. They do that. But what they are trying to do is they're saying this whole, well, why do I keep erasing? This whole thing with the sigma included is equal to that. It's not that, okay? It's that, <laughs> okay? So let's ignore this stupid number. What we're gonna do now is we're just gonna go do what we normally do for this, where we go and work out, is it arithmetic, geometric? How do we do that? Well, well done if you remember, term one. We need to go find term two, and we need to go find term three. To find term one, you just start with whatever this number is. That's a P equals to zero, and you just plug it into there. So you're gonna say a third times by zero plus one over six, and that'll give you one over six. Then we say a third multiplied by, now what you do is you take this number and you increase it by one. So that'll be a one now, because it was a zero, so now it's a one. And that'll end up giving us, calculator, talk to me, one over two. And then we're gonna increase the number again to a two. So this number and the term number do not always correlate. It only correlates when this number is a one. But if it's something different, then it doesn't match and it doesn't have to match. So now we're gonna do that. Calculator, let's do it again. Okay, times two plus one over six. Okay, so five over six, then we stop there. When you have the first three terms, that is more than enough to try work out, is it arithmetic or is it geometric? I think it's gonna be arithmetic, and the way that I test is I see what is term two minus term one. Well, that's a half minus one over sixth, which is going to be one over three. Then I would like to see that that stays the same if I minus the next two terms because we know that if something is arithmetic, it has a common difference. Ah, one over three. There we go. The reason I knew it was arithmetic is because if I look at this here, I don't see any weird like exponents over here. That's usually, when there's exponents, then it's normally geometric. If it was geometric, then I would look for, what is term two divided by term one? And then I would see what is term three divided by term two. And I would want those answers to be the same because geometrics have a common ratio, whereas arithmetics have a common difference. If you're confused, think about this, three, seven, uh, 11, 15. Can you see? I'm adding four, adding four, adding four. But that's the same as saying seven minus three is four, so term two minus term one. And then term three minus term two would be 11 minus seven, which is also four. So can you see that I'm, all that I was checking for was that, okay? That tells me it's arithmetic. Now, what we need to understand, forget about that number still. This thing here, it means the sum of. So I'm gonna go get my sum of formula. Should I get an arithmetic one? Or should I get a geometric? Or do you just feel like choosing anyone? <laughs> well, it's gonna be arithmetic because we found out that it's an arithmetic pattern. So that's gonna be the um, n over two, two a plus n minus one times d. Now we know that they said the sum of all of this stuff is equal to that. Aha, so we're gonna put that over here, 20 and one over six. Guys, be careful with this number, especially those of you and most of you are using Casio calculators. If you type this number on the calculator, quickly go type it on the calculator for me. If you ended up with 10 over three, that is wrong. Your teacher has not done a good enough effort to show you that the Casio calculator has a bit of a glitch. You cannot just type it like this new calculator. You can't just say, oh, I'll put the fraction button and then you go put one over six. And then you're like, oh, backspace, backspace, 20. What that does is it turns this into a multiplication. So what you rather do is you say shift, then you push that fraction button, and what you'll see is that your calculator will convert it into a three-way like that. That is where you put that bad boy in over there, if we have to go write that out just now. Okay, just a little uh, tip over there. Okay, now, ooh, this one's gonna be quite tricky. 
because ooh, hoo, hoo, a lot of learners are going to say that this number is this number. Because in class, makes me quite annoyed, what teachers do is they always show you examples where the number at the bottom is a 1, and then they put an N over here. And over time, that allows you to believe that these are always the same. But this number here is not the number, or well, it's not always, <laughs> I should say that, it's not always the number, hey, where's that blue circle going? Not always the number of terms. It is only the number of terms when this number is a one, okay? So this is not n. So just leave that, leave that for now. We'll come back to that k later on, okay? Uh, so we're just going to leave it as an n now. And then a is term number one, which is one over six. This question's got quite a bit of good information, actually. And then n is, we don't know what the number of terms are. And then d is your common difference, which we said is a third. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to go type that on the calculator and just get, uh, get it uh, written a little bit better. If you type it on the calculator, it's actually 121 over 6. Now, I like that. Let's use that rather. Okay. N over 2. Now, that'll give us a third. Then I'm going to multiply this third into the brackets. So it'll be a third N minus a third. Oh, thank goodness. These two thirds are going to cancel. So life's going to get a little bit more simplified. So those two, that one and that one will cancel. And so you just have that now, okay? So what I'm now going to do is just multiply these two together. So the n multiplies. You can think of this as n over 3. So n times n is going to be n squared. And then 2 times 3 is 6. Now, because these 6s are the same, we can just cancel them. So we end up with 121 is equal to n squared. Now, well, this is actually quite a good question. So to get n by itself, you would say plus minus the square root of 121. And so n would be plus or minus 11. But we know that n is the number of terms. Kevin, I thought you said it's not. No, this n is the number of terms, always. This is number of terms. This number at the top is not always the number of terms. I've got a little formula I'm going to show you now, okay? Okay, but now we know that n, which is your number of terms, cannot be a negative number you can only have a positive number of terms. So therefore, the number of terms is 11. So how do we relate that to k? Well, if you've watched my sigma notation videos, you would remember that I've said the following before. Your number of terms is equal to the number at the top minus the number at the bottom plus 1. So number of terms, we've already figured that out, is 11. Okay, the number at the top is called k. The number at the bottom is called, well, it's zero, and then say plus one. Then go ahead and solve for k, and what you would find is that, well, let's just quickly do this properly, k plus one. So k will be equal to 10. It is given that the general term of a quadratic number pattern is that. And the first term of the first differences is seven. What is the first term of the first differences? Well, let's say we have a number pattern that goes three, five, nine, 15. So the first differences would be two, four, and six. Those are called first differences, okay? Then if we had to go down again, two and two, those are called your second differences. Right, so, and quadratic, because the second differences remain constant. That is what quadratic is. So it says that um, we've got the sequence, and it says that the first term of the first differences is 7. So what they're doing is they're saying that this part here is a 7. They're saying that that's a 7. Okay, so what we'll do is let's just go find term number one. So let's go find term one. So to find term one, you're just gonna say one squared plus that, plus that, and that would eventually give you 10 plus b. Then term two 
is going to be, so you plug in a two now, that's a B, uh, plus nine. And so that would eventually give you four plus nine is 13 plus two B. Okay, so term one is 10 plus B, term two is 13 plus two B. They said the first difference, so that would be the difference between those two, is seven. So what that means is this one minus this one must give us seven. Just like five minus three gives us two, okay? So we can then say that 13 plus 2b minus this term. Now that term is more than one term, so you have to put it into a bracket. That difference is seven. So 13 plus 2b minus 10 minus b must give us seven. So go ahead, solve this however you would like to solve it, but we should eventually find out that b is gonna be four, okay? So that's quite a good one. b would be, um, oh, it says here, show that b is four. When a lot of learners ask me, they're like, um, Kevin, um, if b is four, if they wanted to show that b is four, can I put the four in the place of b? No, you mustn't do that, guys. Um, you must rather leave it as an unknown, solve it, and then show that it will give you four, okay? Determine the value of the 60th term. Okay, well, that's very easy because we know the formula is, we can put b as four. Okay, so b is four. And so they said determine the value of term 60. So term 60 would then be 60 squared plus four times 60 plus nine. And so if you go ahead and type that all in, you get 3,000. 849, 3,849. This question, determine the general term for the sequence of the first differences. Write your answer in the following form. Okay, so let me show you how this works. So we know that term one is uh, 10 plus B, but we know B is four. So term one is 14. Then term two is 13 plus uh, two times four, which is eight, so 13 plus eight is 21, okay? And then term three, let's just quickly find term three. That would be, um, so to find term three, I'm just using this formula. So three squared plus four, because B is four, remember, plus nine. So that would be three squared plus four times three plus nine. So that would be 30, okay. Uh, let's do one more. So term four, would be four squared plus four times four, because B is four, that's why I'm filling that in there, plus nine, and that'll give us 41. Okay, so these are the first four terms of this pattern. Now I'm gonna go down to the next level where we have our first differences. Difference means minus, so it's this one minus this one is seven. This one minus this one is nine. This one minus this one is 11. So can you see that the first differences form a pattern? Look how it goes, seven, nine, 11. So it's going up by the same amount. If you are a grade 12 learner, that is called arithmetic. If you are a grade 11 learner, then you could think of that as a linear pattern. They are exactly the same thing. So if you are a grade 11 learner right now, and if you are a grade 12 learner, I'll show you two different ways. So I'll start with grade, uh, grade 12. So grade 12, uh, we now know that for a arithmetic or a constant difference kind of pattern, we just use this formula over here. Don't worry about their silly letters. We'll get to that just now. So we can just go um, that the formula is going to be A, which is term one, which is seven. And then the number of terms, we're gonna leave that as a unknown, we're not trying to solve that, we're just trying to get a formula. And then the difference, we are, we are adding two each time, okay? And so if you had to go simplify this, you'd get seven plus two n minus two, and so that would be five plus two n. So you could now use this over here. So instead of saying n, we could say p. So you see the n and the, so we could just say two p plus five. Okay, now for grade 11, um, there's different ways that teachers do this, but you might remember, your teacher might do something like TN is equal to AN plus B or something like that, okay? Now, maybe even plus C. Now, 
A is the number that we are plussing each time. So to go from here to here, we are plussing two. So you would say two N. And then to find B, there's multiple ways. Uh, one of the ways is to find B is to find out what is term number zero in that pattern. So if you had to go back, that would become a five. And so B would be five, which is what we got there. But another approach is to, uh, you could choose any one of these. Which one do you want to choose? Okay, if, let's say you chose this one. That is the number nine, and that is position number two in that pattern. So you would say that nine is the value at position number two, N, okay, plus um, B. And then you would say nine is equal to four plus B. If you had to solve, B would be five. So you would then get the exact same answer. Okay, grade 11, grade 12, you choose what you're comfortable with. Right, then this question says, which two consecutive terms, consecutive means immediately after each other, in the quadratic pattern, these ones over here, will have a first, sorry, um, in the quadratic pattern, have a first difference of 157. Okay. Okay, so that's the quadratic pattern that we had. I just moved it up a bit. Then we've got the first difference numbers, which is 7, 9, 11. Now they said, which two consecutive terms, don't worry about that part right now, will the number pattern have a first difference, sorry, which two consecutive, da da da, have a first difference. Oh, okay, so have a first difference of 157. Remember, these are the first differences. So we could say that these two have a first difference of seven. So ignore this part right now, we'll get back to that. They just said first difference of 157. So this is your first difference pattern, and we wanna know where will, if these numbers keep going on, where will we end up with 157? So we could then go use our formula that we made, TP equals to 2P plus five. And we said that the value is gonna be 157. We don't know the position, so that's unknown. And then we solve. So we take the five to the left and we end up with 152 equals to 2P. Divide both sides by two and we should end up with 76. So that means term number 76 in this pattern will have a value of 157, term number 76. Now, to try onto the question now, to try figure out this, between which two terms is that in the quadratic number pattern, all we do is the following. I like to just look at this. We can say that the number seven, seven, or sorry, term one in the first difference pattern, so this is term one in the first difference pattern, that goes between term one and term two in the quadratic, goes between term one and term two in the quadratic pattern. So term one goes in between term one and term two. So you see how these match. So we could then say that term 157, so we could then say that term 76 in the first difference pattern goes between term, now if this is a one, this is a one. If this is a 76, then we say 76 and term, so you then add one, so it'll be 77. So it's gonna be, it's the number 157 is gonna be between term number 76 and term number 77 in this pattern. It would be in between those two. And so which two consecutive terms in the quadratic number pattern? Term 76 and term 77. Sketched below is the graph of h of x. Okay, now you should immediately identify that is the equation of a hyperbola, and we can see over here we have a hyperbola. The asymptotes, what are the asymptotes? It's the dotted lines. We can find those dotted lines from the equation um, over here and over here. Okay, but we'll get to that just now. And then it says the asymptotes intersect at the point one and two. Okay, so let's have a look at that quickly. So that point over there would have an x value of one 
and a y value of two. You can see this x value is one, you can see this y value is two, so where they intersect is the point one and two. First question for two marks says, write down the values of p and q. Okay, so you gotta be careful here. Sometimes they will do this, they'll say one over x minus p plus q. So you, this doesn't mean left or right, okay? They just, they can choose to put a minus here or a plus. They can choose whatever they want. You got to make it all correct. So don't look at this right now. Don't look at that. What we should identify is that this is a hyperbola. Has it moved right or left? Well, remember, hyperbolas always start on the, uh, they always start at the center. They always start there. Let me highlight that for you. That is where hyperbola starts, right in the middle, okay? So along the y-axis, ooh, what happened there? So once again, hyperbola starts along the y-axis and along the x-axis. But what we can see is that this dotted line has gone to the right. So we have moved one place to the right. So how do you show that over here? Do you say x plus one? No, that would mean left. So you're gonna say x minus one. Okay, and then if we look at this dotted line, we have moved up by two places. And so we don't say minus two, we say plus two. It's only with the horizontal, with the X, that we say opposite. Right means minus, left means plus. Okay, now we can have a look here. So we can then see that P is going to have to be negative one. And Q is going to have to be positive 2. But if their base equation was like this, check, this is where it's going to make sense. If, the, if they told you, because they can do this, they could have done this, okay? Then, can you see that the minus is already there? So then what we would do is we'd just say, okay, well then P would have to be positive 1 instead of saying negative one. So you always have to be careful with how they've given you as, what they've given you as the base. Either they're gonna have a plus or a minus. Okay, and it doesn't matter, they can change it. Okay, so we now have our equation as one over x minus one plus two. So that is our equation for, for this, um, let's get rid of all of that. Okay, next question says, uh, we've done this one. This one says calculate the coordinates of the x-intercept of the graph. So the x-intercept, um, what do we do? Or this should actually be h of x. To find the x-intercept, we make the y equal to zero. Now something I want you to get into the habit of doing is we're looking for an x-intercept. Now we can see that there's the x-intercept. So your answer has to be somewhere between zero and one. It doesn't, it might not necessarily be exactly in the middle, but it must be somewhere between the two. So if you get an answer that is somewhere outside of that, then you have made a little mistake, okay? So remember to find a y-intercept, you make uh, y zero. I'm gonna take this negative two over to the other side. Uh, one, I'm then gonna multiply this over to the other side. So it ends up becoming negative two bracket x minus one equals to one. I'm going to multiply the negative 2 into the bracket. It will actually turn that part into a positive. I'm then going to take the 2 over to the other side until we end up with negative 2x equals negative 1. Divide both sides by negative 2 and you end up with a half. Okay, so it is exactly in the middle. But if you got an answer that was larger than 1 or smaller than 0, then you have made a little mistake. And then it's nice to just be able to see that and then go see where you made a small mistake. Okay, so there we go. So we know that that coordinate there, whoops, is a half and zero. Oh, they said calculate the coordinates. Oh, so it's very important that we, when you give your final answer, you're gonna say a half and zero, because they want the x and the y, because those are coordinates. This question says, write down the x coordinate of the x-intercept of g, if g is equal to that. Okay. So, we've got to understand a few things. If they said g of x is equal to h of x plus 3 like that, or they could have said g of x is equal to h of x plus 3, which is the one that they have. And these two things mean two different things. This one over here is with the x. It's in the bracket with the x. So this is 
horizontal. Horizontal. When it's on the outside like that, that is vertical. Okay, so this one would move the graph vertically, this one moves it horizontally. But now remember, horizontal is opposite to what you would naturally think. When they say plus three, x plus three, it actually means they're gonna move the graph three places to the left. So they said write down the x coordinate of this new graph. So here's the current x coordinate, okay? Now you're just gonna move that three places left. So you could just say a half, whoopsie, minus three, and that would give you negative five over two, which is negative two and a half. So you would say negative five over two and zero because they want the coordinates. This question over here says, the equation of an axis of symmetry of h is y equals to x plus t, determine the value of t. Okay, very interesting, I mean, very easy question, but let me explain to you um, just the theory behind it. So we know that for any hyperbola, okay, maybe this is a hyperbola that is, okay, let's just do the one we have like that. Now going through those intersection points, we have symmetry lines. Let's do them in a different color. And like that, okay? So we have two of those for all hyperbolas. So they have equations of x plus c, and then this one always has a negative gradient. But the gradient is always one and negative one. So here it's one, here it's negative one. That is always going to be true. So if you look carefully, they said that they want the symmetry line that has the positive gradient. You see it's got a positive one x over there. Okay, positive. So that means they are looking for this symmetry line. They're not looking for that one. I mean, whoa, where was that? They're not looking for that one. So we're looking for, so we're gonna say y equals to x plus t. Then to find the c value on all of these symmetry lines, we've what we've learned is that we should always use this point and plug it in. So we know that point. It's that got the coordinates one and two. So we plug the two into the y, the one into the x, you solve for y and you get a y value of one. So we'll say y equals to x plus one. The last question says, determine the x values for which this is smaller than that. Okay, so I just want to write out the original equation of h. We said it was 1 over x minus 1 plus 2. So that's what our equation looks like. Now can you see that this is almost the same? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that expression. I'm going to, whoopsie. I'm going to bring this over to the other side. So we're going to end up with um, 0 like that. Look at that. So now we have the same equation that we have over here. So what they're now saying is where is this graph, where is this graph bigger than zero? Now where some learners make mistakes here is they say, oh, it's everything to the right of the x-axis because all the x values are bigger than zero. But when they say this, they are saying where is the graph bigger than zero? And what they mean is above the x-axis. If it was the other way, then it would be below the x-axis. So they wanna know where is this graph above the x-axis. So here's the x-axis. So where do we see the graph above the x-axis? Well, that would be there, and it would be all of, whoa, that's ugly, all of that. That is all above the x-axis. This little area over here, that is not above the x-axis. So we let's look at this part first. So it would be whenever x is smaller than the y-intercept, which is a half. Oh, they did also say we could include. Okay, so we can do that. Or it's this area over here, which is when x is larger or equal. No, we can't. Ah, okay, I'll talk about that now. Um, larger than one. We can never include the asymptote. We never um, asymptote because the graph never touches the asymptote. Never included. Okay. 
Now, for those of you that prefer interval notation, you could say um, x element going from negative infinity up to a half with the square bracket. And then we can say or, I know some of you like to do a little u sign for or, you can do that. And then we can go from one, but now that'll be a round bracket, up to infinity. The graphs of f, which is a parabola, and g, which is a exponential, are sketched below. E and h are the x-intercepts, okay. C is the y-intercept. Okay, that's quite interesting. C is the y-intercept of f, okay, yep. And it lies on the asymptote of g. Oh, we can see that. There's the asymptote, of course. Okay. And then, first question for one mark. Write down the y-coordinate of c. Okay, so we just take that equation, which is this one over here. So we just say f of x equals to x squared minus 4x minus 5. And to find this coordinate, we must realize that that is the y-intercept. So to find a y-intercept, we make x equal to 0. We could put a 0 over here. And if you do that, you'd end up with negative 5. So this y-coordinate is negative 5. I'm not going to put the, y, the, the x value because they just asked for the y-coordinate. Okay, now that negative 5 is also the asymptote of g. So the asymptote is always this one over here. So we could already say that q is negative 5. This question says, determine the coordinates of d. Okay, where is D? Is D the turning point? Let's see. The two graphs intersect at D, which is the turning point. Always look out for that because, yeah, just to get that confirmation. All right, so there are multiple ways you could work out the turning point. You could use, um, I mean, the easiest way, in my opinion, is, okay, so if you are a, a grade 11 or 12, my best suggestion is just use minus B over 2A. If you are in grade 12, you could also use calculus if you wanted to. And then if you're also grade 11 or 12, you could use completing of the square, which is my least favorite option. And what that does is you do that whole completing the square scenario, and eventually you'd end up with an equation that has something like, or something like a number. And then from that, you could work out the turning point. My favorite option is minus b over 2a. For the grade 12s who are thinking about calculus, it's wherever you take your, to find a turning point, it's where the graph, um, it's where the gradient is equal to zero. So it's where the first derivative is equal to zero. Okay, but as I said, I suggest minus b over 2a. Because that works perfectly with parabolas. Um, if it was a cubic graph, grade 12s, then you would use uh, calculus. You can't use minus b over 2a. That only works for parabolas. Okay, so I'm going to say f of x equals to x squared, take away 4x, take away 5. Then I'm going to say minus b over 2a. And so that's going to be minus, and then b is negative 4, a is 1, and that'll give you a value of 2. Now have a look at this point. Does it look like it has an x value that's positive? Yes. So if you got a negative here, then you might have made a small little mistake over there, and then you could easily fix that. So get used to checking that it makes sense, okay? Now, we have to find the y value. You're just going to take that x value and plug it into the equation. So we're going to plug x as 2, and this will give us negative 9. So it's going to be 2 and negative 9. This question here says determine the values of a and q. Okay, so we can say g of x equals to a times 2 of x plus q. Now we know q is minus 5. Okay, we, we found that because of the asymptote. So we only have one unknown. When you only have one unknown, you just find a point on the graph. So on this exponential, we can use the point D, which we've just found. And you could plug that in. So the minus 9 is a y value. The x value is 2. Okay. Now, ooh, I see, I see, I see. There are so many learners that combine these two numbers together. But you cannot do that because of this a. This a is only together with that. So I've seen this mistake so many times. So 
2 to the power of 2 is 4, so we could say 4a minus 5. This minus 5 cannot be combined with a, not at all. So we're going to carry this minus 5 over now, and you're going to end up with minus 9 plus 5 equals to 4a. And then minus 9 plus 5 is negative 4. You divide both sides by 4, and a would be negative 1. So a is negative 1 and q is negative 5. Last one says write down the range. Oh, no, it's not the last one. Here's the last one. Write down the range of g. Okay, range of g. So g is this graph over here. So we know that range is the y values. So we always go from smallest to largest. So we could say um, y is an element. Now, if you look at the smallest y value, it would go all the way down to negative infinity. So we could go negative infinity. I'll do interval, I'll do um, set builder notation now. And then the highest value would be the asymptote, but it never touches the asymptote. So we would also keep that as a round bracket. Then for set builder, we can do, uh, you could literally just say y is smaller than negative five. So y is below negative five. Okay, this question, last one, says determine the values of k for which the value of f of x will always be positive. Okay, so now I know a lot of you when you read that, you have a mild heart attack. Now, if you're a student that gets in the 80s and 90s and you want to try get keep your marks like high or aim for higher marks like 100, whatever, um, well, yeah, even if you just want to get 80s and 90s, you should probably try this question. If you're a student that gets in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and when you read this question, it just really does not make any sense, then move on to the next question. You don't have to tackle every single question, okay? Of course, if you've studied this and you're feeling comfortable when you read this, then it's fine. But if you're a student, as I said, who gets 40s, 50s, 60s, or anything below that, and this question just doesn't make any sense to you, don't waste any time on this one, okay? Um, these ones were pretty much okay, but these ones can be a bit weird, and for only two marks, it could take you long to try to figure out what they mean, and it's just a waste of time. Okay, but let's do it anyway. So it says, determine the value of k, or the values of k, for which the value of f of x minus k will always be positive. Okay, so pretty much, f of x, is this graph. It's this graph over here. Okay? Now, at the moment, they said, where will it be positive? Now, remember, when they say something like that, they're not talking about the x values. They're talking about the y values. So if we look at the x-axis, this area has positive y values, whereas this area is negative y values because it's underneath the x-axis. Okay, so they're saying determine the values of k so that the graph will always be positive. What must this be to always be positive? So can you see that this parabola, we would have to move it up. It would need to be moved up so that it goes there. So we would have to move it up. You see this is negative 9. So we would have to move it up a little bit more than 9. Some of you are like, so should we say 10? No, we'll just say that um, we must just move it just a little bit more than 9. So we would want this part over here to say something like plus 9.1, something like that. I'm not saying the answer is 9.1. You'll see what I'm talking about now. But if you could take the graph of f and you could uh, move it up 9.1 units, then the graph would look like this and then it would always be positive, okay? So what we will do is we will say that we want k to be a negative number because this is already a negative. So if k is a negative, then it makes this whole part a positive. So we would want k to be smaller than negative nine. That means k can be values like negative 10, it could be negative 9.1, negative 9.2. Let's say k was negative 10, then your equation would look like this, minus, minus 10, which would end up becoming plus 10, which would then put the graph over there. 
So the answer would be k can be any number smaller than negative 9. So that when it combines with this negative, it turns it into a positive, and now you are saying f of x plus some number. And so it's moving it up. And so if you would, so that's one way to write the answer. The other one is you could say uh, k is an element going from negative infinity up to minus 9. The graphs of g, which is this one over here, and it's inverse. Remember that means inverse. Grade 12 learners, that does not mean... Okay, no, all of you would be grade 12 learners because we only do inverse in grade 12. So grade 12 learners, remember that that um, minus 1, some of you confuse that with the first derivative. But the first derivative has a line like that. If it's inverse, it has a line like that. Okay? So it says that it's the inverse are shown in the diagram. Now remember, your inverse is a reflection across the line y equals to x. And we can see that that is... Whoops, let's actually do that a bit better. Come on. So that is all that an inverse is. It's a reflection across the line y equals to x. Okay? Um, whether we're going to need to know that right now, I'm not sure. I'm just showing you. Um, D and B are the x and y intercepts respectively. C is the x intercept, blah, 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 blah. The graphs of G intersect at A. First question for one mark. Write down the coordinates, the y coordinates of B. Okay, so that's this equation. Okay, that's easy. So we take this equation. And we're just looking for the y-intercept. So to find a y-intercept, you make x0, and you end up with 6. So that means that the y-coordinate of b is 6. You don't have to say 0, 6. They just said the y-coordinate, not the x-coordinate as well. Okay, then it says, let's just put that over there. Then it says, determine the equation of g minus 1 in the form of... Okay, I've left something out here. Hold on. My bad, guys. This is meant to have a little plus n over there. So they're just saying find the equation of g. So how do we find inverse or inverses of equations? Well, we've got lots of videos that we've done on this together. So um, let's have a look. Uh, we've got g of x equals to 2x plus 6. So I like to just write it as y equals to 2x plus 6. Step 1, switch x and y around. Step 2, get y by itself again. So we're going to take the... 6 over, so we have x minus 6 equals to 2y, and then we're going to divide everything by 2. So this will become like that, and like that, and like that. Then we can just simplify, so that will become a half x minus 3. y equals to a half x minus 3. So they want us to write it as g minus 1x equals to a half x minus 3. This question says, determine the coordinates of A. So it's where the two graphs intersect. So we can just make these two equations um, equal to each other, the inverse and the original. So we can just say 2x plus 6 equals to a half x minus 3. And I can already tell you that the x and the y value of A will be exactly the same. Why? Because A is on this line y equals to x. And look here, look carefully. y equals to x, x equals to y. So any point on this line has the same x and y coordinates. For example, this would be 1 and 1. This would be 2 and 2. This would be negative 1, negative 1. So we're going to get two negative values. We can predict that already. And these are things you should start doing to make sure that your answer makes sense. All right, so there's multiple ways you could do this question. You could go get a common denominator, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take the half x over to the left, and I'm going to take the 6 over to the right. And so we're going to end up with 3 over 2x, because 2 minus a half is 1 and a half, which is the same as 3 over 2, and then minus 3 minus 6. So we're going to end up with 3 over 2x equals to negative 9, and so I'm going to divide both sides by 3 over 2 now. You could do this in other ways, but I'm going to divide both sides by 3 over 2, and what would that give? I think that gives us 6, or negative 6. Okay, so that would be negative 6 for the x value. Now, to find the y value, you can just plug it into any one of those equations. I'm going to plug it into this one. So g of negative 6 equals to 2 times negative 6 plus 6, and that will give us negative 6. 
see what we said, that if x is negative 6, y would also be negative 6. This question says, calculate the length of AB. So that's pretty straightforward. Hey guys, we're just going to use the distance formula. So we know the distance formula by now, but it's something like x2 minus x1 plus y2 minus y1 squared. Okay, so we're going to find the distance of AB. I'm going to use this as my point 2 and this is my point 1. So the coordinates here would actually be 0 and 6 and then negative 6, negative 6. Okay, so let's go fill this all in. So we end up with, um, okay, 0, take away negative 6 and then 6, take away negative 6. And if we had to go work this all out, you end up with 6 square root 5, which to two decimal places is 13.42. 13.42. Don't worry about saying units or anything like that for these kinds of questions. Well, I mean, you could if you wanted to, but on the memos, they're not that strict about that. Okay, um, so calculate the length of A, but if you did do it, it wouldn't be wrong. Okay, this last one for five marks, calculate the area of triangle ABC. Triangle ABC, so we've got that. Okay, now keep in mind, they've asked us to find the distance of that line, so maybe that's a bit of a hint. I'm not sure, but let's see. Now, we know that the area of a triangle we can find it in two different ways. The first way is to use half base times height. But what's important is that this base and this height, they must be 90 degrees to each other, okay? The second way is if we have angles, then we use half AB sin of angle C. You know the trigonometry area formula. So, sure, this one we're gonna have to look at now. Like if this, if this angle here was 90 degrees, then it's easy because then this could be your base and this could be your height. So let's go check if those are 90 degrees. Maybe we are in luck. So we have B's coordinates to, oh, by the way, to see if something's 90 degrees, we need to look at the gradient of this line, which we already have as two because that's the gradient. And then we need the gradient of this line. Then we will multiply them m1 multiplied by m2, and if the answer is negative 1, then they are perpendicular, remember? So let's go work out the gradient of um, AB. Oh no, we have that, we know that, remember we said. So the gradient of AB is 2. Now to work out the gradient of BC, we use the gradient formula. Okay, and so, oh but we don't have C's coordinates. Okay, but that's fine, because we do know um, I mean, okay, <laughs> so there's different ways you could do this, but we could take the equation of the inverse of G, which we found in this question here, and we could go work out the uh, x-intercept, and that would be this one. But if you understand inverses very well, although we can't say B to C is the inverse. Okay, never mind, let's do it that way. So what did we find that equation as? I think we said it was a half x minus three, yes. That was the equation of g minus one, remember? So to find the coordinates of c, we could make uh, y zero. So we could go y equals to zero, and we could say three equals to a half x, take the two to the, or you could divide by half, however you wanna do that. You should end up with six. So this would be six and zero. So now we're gonna go work out the gradient of this line. And so we're gonna say, we could say for example, zero take away six over six take away zero. And that's gonna give us negative one. Ah, okay. So the gradient of this line is positive two and the gradient of this one is negative one. So if we multiply these two numbers, we won't get minus one. And so unfortunately, this is not going to be 90 degrees. These two lines are not going to be perpendicular. If they were, it would have made our life much easier. Okay, what we're going to do, or what I think will work well, is this is actually a bit of a paper two kind of question, to be honest. So 
what we can go and do, I, I, I'm not gonna, you could probably somehow make this one work eventually. There are ways, but it would be very long. You could, you could work out the equation of the perpendicular um, or the altitude, whatever, 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 which would be something like that. And you could work out that thing's equation. You could, you could then get the coordinates of a year and you could work out the perpendicular height, but that's gonna be quite a long method. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to work out this angle. And the way I'm gonna do that is I'm actually only gonna focus on this little triangle over here. And I'm gonna use inclination angles, so I need the gradient to get this angle, and I can get this angle, because you can imagine that that's a line going through there. And then once I've got those two angles, I can then work out this angle, okay? Because remember, inclination angles, it has something to do with tan and gradient and inclination angle. So we know the gradient of dB. We know that that gradient is 2. So we could say um, tan, shift tan of 2, and that'll give us 63.43 degrees. So this is 63.43 degrees. Then we can now go work out this angle. Now be careful because this one, this one's gradient is negative one. So you can rather say shift tan of positive one. We don't put the negative over there. And that'll give you 45 degrees. Now, if you wanted to work out the inclination angle, you would then say 180 minus 45, and that would give you 135. And that would be this angle on the outside because inclination angle is always the angle on the right-hand side. But we just want this one on the inside, so that would be the 45 degrees, okay? So we now have this as 45 degrees. And so we could then use sum of angles in a triangle to find this one. So we could say angle DBC is gonna be 180, minus 45, minus 63.43, sum, angles, triangle. And if we work out angle DBC, we would get 71.57 degrees, 71.57 degrees. So that would be this one, 71.57. Okay, now I'm gonna go back to the original triangle that we're trying to find, which is this one over here. See, but now we have an angle in that triangle. And once you have an angle, then we can use the sin rule. Remember that the sin rule says that if we have a triangle that's not an, I mean, it can be a 90 degrees, but this formula works nicely when it's not 90 degrees. Um, I mean, it always works, but we, we usually wouldn't use it if it's 90 degrees. Then there'd be easier ways. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, that's a horrible triangle, Kevin. Ugh, whenever I draw triangles, I somehow always make one of the angles 90 degrees. Okay, so there we go. Now, the, the, the sin rule tells us for the area that if you have an angle and you have the two sides next to that angle, then you can use this formula. So we know the length of this side, so we need to now go get the length of BC. So to work out the length of BC, we use the distance formula. Okay, and so I'm just gonna say um, six, whoops, what happened there? Six minus zero plus, so six minus zero and then zero minus six squared. And if we work that out, we get, if you round to two decimal, I'm actually just gonna keep it as six decimal, uh, so, sorry, six square root two. I'm gonna keep it like that, okay? Um, as our length of, whoops, not that one, this one over here. Now we can go use the area formula. So area of triangle A, B, C would then be a half, 13.42 multiplied by six square root two, multiplied by the sin of the angle between those two, which is 71.57. Wow, what a question. Go ahead, type that all in. And we should get 54.02. Now, for these area ones, we do want to say um, units 
squared. Now, on the memo, there are different techniques that they showed, and they got different answers. Some of them got 53.99, some of them got 54. Um, they got 53.99 when they used this angle. They calculated this angle, and then they used these two sides. So it will give you slightly different answers. But 54.02 would also be taken as, a, as a, would, would have been accepted. So, yeah. Quite an interesting question, uses a bit of gray uh, paper two type of stuff. So yeah. 12,000 Rand was invested in a fund that paid interest at M% per annum compounded quarterly. After 24 months, the value of the investment was that. Determine the value of M. Okay, so this is actually a grade 11 question. So if you are a grade 12 learner watching this, be careful when you look at these financial maths questions and all of a sudden you wanna go use your F or P formulas. You gotta be careful. They are also gonna test you on grade 11 work. So it says 12,000 Rand was invested and that was it. They didn't say 12,000 Rand was invested every single month. They didn't say 12,000 Rand was invested every single year. No, they just invested 12,000 Rand once. So we're only gonna use the normal compound interest formula from grade 11. If you are a grade 11 learner, you know what I'm talking about, obviously. So we know that the value became that. So we're gonna say 13,459. We know that it started as that. The interest rate per year, we don't know. So we're just gonna say um, M. Okay, now we would normally, don't be tempted to put a 12 over here. This one's actually compounded quarterly. So should we put a four or a three? Well, ah, let me explain. So if you have January, February, March, April, May, oh, I'm not gonna run it, I'm gonna run out of space. July, August, Sept, October, November, and December. If you divide that into quarters, that's what you get. So it takes place every three months, but how many times, how many quarters are there in a year? There are one, two, three, four quarters. That is the number you put at the bottom there. It's how many times does it happen per year? So it would happen once there, then there, then there, and then it would happen again at the end of December. So there are four compounding periods happening per year. Now, for this value over here, this is gonna catch a lot of learners out. They said after 24 months. Now, 24 months is two years. So if you are comp, so you could say here two times four. That's what I was trying to get to. Um, you're actually not gonna use 24 at all. They're trying to confuse you. So it's two years, and each year you are compounding four times. So how many times would you compound altogether? Eight times, okay? Now, to work this out, what we could do is divide by 12,000 first, and then that would just be an eight. The next thing we can do is take the eighth root on both sides, okay? Because that'll cancel out this part over here. And so, but now, Trust me on this, don't use your calculator right now. Otherwise, you're gonna have to be rounding off the whole time. Just leave it as long as you can, like that. Then on this side, we don't have the eight anymore. There we go. Because this eight canceled, or the square root, the eighth root canceled that out. Okay, don't type this on your calculator yet, just leave it. And now what we do is you don't even need a bracket anymore. So you can take the one over. So you're just gonna have that. But now the one is not inside the root, okay? So it's there. Now we have that. Then what you do is you multiply all of this by four. Or you could also put the, you could also multiply the four there and then the four there. That's also okay. But I'm just gonna multiply the whole thing by four. And there we go. Then you go calculate what M is and then multiply that by 100 to get the percentage. And we should get, if you multiply by 100 as well, so just say like that, and we would get 5.78% on 31 January 2022, Tino deposits a thousand rand into an account that pays interest at 7.5% compound monthly. He continues to deposit a thousand rand on the last day of every month. Okay, so this is immediately a grade 12 question because you've got someone who is depositing money regularly, and it's the same value, 
and he yeah, and he just does that regularly. Okay, so it says, will Tino have sufficient funds in the account on 1 January 2023 to buy a computer that costs 13,000 Rand? Justify your answer by means of a calculation. Okay, so we've got a guy. Does he want money right now or does he want money in the future? He wants money in the uh, future. He starts here, but he wants money in the future. So that immediately means future value formula, which is like that. Now, we know how much he's going to deposit. That's a thousand rand. So we've got this value. We know the interest rate, which is this value. And the only tricky one that can sometimes get us is N. So let's try to make sense of this. So on 31 January, Tino deposits a thousand rand. Okay, so 31 January 2022. And then it says that he continues depositing on the last day of every month. So that's going to be end of February end of Feb, I'm just going to say March, but you get that I mean the end of March, end of March, end of April, um, March, April, uh, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, end of December. He says that uh, he continues depositing. He'll make the last deposit on 31 December. Okay, now, does he leave the money in the account for a little bit? Well, it says, will Tino have enough on the 1st of January? No, that's literally one day later. So he, it's not like if this said, ah, if this said 31 January, then you would have to take all of this that you calculated and then use the compound formula. You know how they sometimes add a bracket on here? And then you would let that money go for one more month. But... He pretty much stops on the 31st of December, and then the very next day, he sees if he has enough. So that's, we don't need to worry about compounding further. So how many payments does he make? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Okay, so N would be 12. So we're just gonna go like this, 1,000, well, not 10,000. So one plus, now the interest rate is 7.5%, so you could say 7.5%, or you could say 7.5 over 100, or you could just say 0 0.075. It's compounded monthly, and here you would normally say the years times 12 or however, but this number here is actually the number of payments. So how many payments is this guy making? Well, we said 12 minus 1. And then 7.5% over 12. Okay, go ahead, type that all in and let's see what we get. If you use the percentage, like the way I've written it, then you must put the percentage on the calculator. I know we've looked at previous lessons where we look at rules like the person should start paying after one month, blah, 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 blah. Those are just nice rules to help us calculate the number of payments when it's like seven years or eight years and you don't want to go count everything like we did over here because that would take really long. But when it's only a one-year question, then I actually like to just make a number line so that I don't have to worry about did he start after one month? Do we add one? Do we minus one? Do we minus two? What happened? I just like to draw the number line and I just look and see what happened. Okay. Um, but as I said, if it was seven years or eight years, then you've got to use those little tricks that I've showed you with adding one, taking away, all of that. But if you can visually just see it and write it out, then it's better. Right. Let's see what we get here. Okay. This guy ends up getting 12,000. 421 rand and 22 cents. So he's not going to have enough money. So does not have enough. Tabo plans to buy a car that will cost 250,000. He will pay a deposit of 15% and take out a loan for the balance. The interest on the loan is that. Calculate the value of the loan. Okay, so that's an easy question, hence it's only one mark. Let's quickly explain. Tabo would like to buy a car. How much is the car? 250,000 Rand. Now, Tabo can pay 250,000 Rand up front, then that's it. He does not need to use the bank because he paid for everything with his own money. But what he rather decided to do is he will pay a deposit of 15%. So what is 15% of 250,000? 
37,500. So that means that Tabor will pay that amount. So paid by Tabor. So how much does he need to borrow from the bank? Well, you just go minus those two numbers. Okay, let's see. 212,500. That is the amount that he would have to go borrow from the bank. Because when you buy a car, the person who is selling the car, do they want their money now or later? They want their money immediately. So they say to Tabo, okay, Tabo, you're going to give us 15%. So Tabo gives them 15%. Tabo then organizes a bank loan, with which is 212,500. The bank goes and pays the rest of, the bank goes and gives the 212,500 so that the person who sells the car is now very happy because they've got all of their money. The rest of the years is going to involve Tabo paying back the bank. Tabo doesn't actually pay back the car dealership. The car dealership gets all of their money on the same day. Some of it is paid by the bank, some of it is paid by Tabo, and then after that, the relationship is now between Tabo and the bank. The car dealership is completely out of it. Does that make sense? That's how it works in real life. Just trying to help you out with that. So, um, that's not really going to help how these questions work, but just one day when you go buy a car, that's how it works. You're not going to pay back the car dealership. You're going to pay back the bank, and the bank is going to pay off the car dealership immediately. Okay? So, this question. The first repayment will be made six months after the loan has been granted. The loan will re be repaid over a period of six years after it has been granted. Calculate the monthly installment. Okay, that's quite a good one. Right, so because it's a loan, uh, we're going to use the present value formula, okay? So x1 minus 1 plus the interest, negative n over i. Now we've got to be very careful. We've learned that when you take out a loan, when should your first payment take place? Let's do some revision here for us quickly. First payment is after one month. That is when your first payment is supposed to happen. When does this first payment get taken place? After six months. So now listen carefully. How many payments has this person missed? Some of you are going to say six. Some of you are going to say five. The correct answer is five. Because if you are supposed to start after one month, so let's quickly say here, let's say um, zero. That's the starting position. Then if you start paying after one month, so that's your first payment. Second payment, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. So when you take out a loan over here, you are supposed to make your first payment over here. So this person did not make that payment, did not make that payment, did not make that one, did not make that one, did not make that one, and then they paid there. So they missed five payments, okay? So if you start after six months. When they say after six months, they mean at six months. Um, five payments have been must. Now, we don't do this with the future value, but with the present value formula, because some of you, you're going to go put the number 212,500 over here. But that is only going to be 212,500 if the first payment was made after one month. If the person starts paying back their loan late, then you need to use the grade 11 compound interest formula, 13% over 12, for the amount of payments that have been missed, which was five. Remember that, with a loan, or when you are using the present value formula, if this is not satisfied, then you have to compound that value by five months. Why do we do that? Well, in real life, Tabor has a loan of 212,500. That, that means Tabor owes the bank 212,500 rand. But Tabor was a bit naughty and he did not make his first payment when he was supposed to. So guess what? When you go to the bank and you ask them, hey bank, sorry I've been a bit late, um, do I, how much do I owe you? The bank is actually going to now tell Tabo that he owes them more because the, the loan 
has been growing with interest and Tabo has not make has not been making any payments to try bring that value down so that the loan is just growing 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 but Tabo's payments have not started yet so they have not been able to start bringing the loan value down okay so now how much uh, what do we need to work out here oh calculate the monthly installment okay so we don't know what that is now the interest rate is 13% per month. Now, the number of payments, we would normally, we would normally just say six years times 12, which is 72. That is under a normal uh, scenario if Tabo decided to pay when he was supposed to. But he has missed the first five payments. So we're gonna say minus five, and so he's only gonna make 67 payments. Now some of you are like, ah, oh, so he, he's actually gonna end up paying less because he only has to pay 67 times instead of 72 times. Not true. Because he has started late, his monthly payment is now gonna be more than what it would have been if he had started on time, because now he has to catch up. And so we are gonna say negative 67 over here, and then 0 0.13 over 12. Now, this looks like an absolute mess, right? <laughs> so the way that you solve this, I would not use my calculator right now. I would try to just get everything organized. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this part here and I'm gonna multiply it over. And then I'm gonna take, oh wait, let's leave that there for now. Then I'm gonna take this part and I'm gonna divide it underneath. And then you would have X by itself. Okay, so that's gonna give us um, Two one two five hundred. Well, let's say uh, x is going to be equal to two one two five hundred one plus zero point one three over twelve to five multiplied by zero point one three over twelve. You see, so I've moved that part up there. Then I'm going to divide all of that by this part minus sixty seven like that. Now you can go ahead and type all of that on your calculator. And we are gonna end up with 4724.96. That is how much Tabo will pay per month. Determine, now some learners confuse this with inverse. Inverse goes minus one. When it's just got a little one there, that means the first derivative using first principles. Okay, so the first principles is when we use this formula. Oh, I'm supposed to say um, da, 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 equals to the limit as h goes to zero of x squared plus x. Okay. Now, for the whole question, you have to write this part down. Okay, so that's going to be, um, sorry, what I wanted to do here was just write down the formula. Uh, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Okay, so now we're gonna, um, some learners really struggle with this, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna focus in on this part for now. So it says that you're gonna replace all the x's with x plus h, so you're gonna go to this equation, and you're gonna replace, okay, I'm gonna run out of space there. You're gonna replace all the x's with x plus h. Did you see that? So I took this x, and I replaced it with x plus h there, and then I took this x and I replaced it with x plus h. So that is that part complete. So let's just do that. Then I'm gonna do this part, but that's the easiest part because that is literally just f of x, which is just that. And so there we go. So now I'm gonna show you how you would do it in a test, like how you'd write it all out. So you'd have to say equals to lim h goes to zero. You have to keep writing that part down. It's so silly, but we do. And then you're just gonna say x plus h squared plus x plus h. Now be careful, minus, then put it in brackets because it's x squared plus x. And then at the bottom, h. Okay, next step, write the silly stuff down. Okay, now we're going to go multiply these brackets out. Please, please, please don't make the little mistake of saying x squared, h squared. You have to remember that there's going to be a middle term as well because you have to put the two brackets next to each other. But now to save space, I'm just going to go, this is what you would have gotten if you put x plus h 
and x plus h, and you multiplied it all out, and you simplify, you would eventually get that, okay? And then this just becomes x plus h. Now, it's very important that you've used brackets here so that you get that over h. Now, going into the next step, we're going to cancel. But I've said this so many times. Everything without an h must cancel. So what that means, and if, if that doesn't happen, you have made a mistake, guaranteed. So can you see that this x square will cancel with that x square, and this x will cancel with this x. If your x's are not cancelling here, it's because you did not use a bracket over there, and so this minus did not turn that into a minus. That's what happens a lot. Okay, so that would cancel out there, and then everything else doesn't cancel. So can you see that everything that owned, that did not have any h's, they cancelled out, and that is what is supposed to happen. So it's a nice way to check yourself along the way. Okay, so what we have left is 2xh plus h squared. Uh, oh, don't worry, don't forget about that one. Plus h, there we go. Okay, next step, take out a common factor of h, and then you'd be left with 2x plus h plus one over h. Now, what would happen is that these h's cancel. Beautiful, we want that to happen. Well, let's actually leave it there, cancel, cancel. And so we now end up with limit, well, limit h goes to zero of two x plus h plus one. Now we can let h go to zero, and so we end up with two x plus one. And you can check yourself. If you wanted to use the first derivative on this and you had to use the FOST method, you would put the two in the front, so that would give you two x, and then this would just become one. And it's the same answer. And so there we go, done. Why can't we just let h go to zero in the very beginning? Well, because zero is at the denominator, and if you have a zero in the denominator, well, that's undefined. But if you cancel the h out, then you don't have an h in the denominator anymore. Determine the first derivative of that. Okay, but it's only three marks, so you don't have to go use first principles. Thank goodness, that would be horrible. So let's just write this thing down. Um, f of x equals to 2x5 minus 3x4 plus 8x. Right, so we're just going to take the first derivative using the normal method, where you take the 5, multiply it to the front, and then subtract 1. Here's the next one. Take the 4, multiply it to the front, subtract 1. Here's the 1, multiply it to the front, subtract 1, so that becomes a 0, so that just falls away. And there is our answer. The tangent to this cubic equation has a minimum gradient. Okay, let's talk about minimum gradient of a tangent. So if you have a cubic graph, you could have one that goes like this, or you could have one that goes the other way, like that. Now, in this kind of scenario over here, your, okay, well, first of all, the steepest gradient that you can find, or the steepest tangent that you can find is always going to be at the inflection point of a graph. So it would be like that, or like that, for example, okay? That is where you would find the steepest. This one would be called the minimum, minimum gradient of tangent, and this one would be called maximum gradient of tangent. And once again, this one is going to be a minimum gradient because it is negative. So like, for example, negative 8, whereas this one has a positive gradient, so it could be like positive 8. Okay, so they said that the tangent has a minimum gradient. So we have a scenario that looks like this over here. Now they're telling us that this is happening at the place uh, negative 1, negative 7, negative 1, negative 7. They say for which values of x will the graph be concave up? Now, concave up, uh, you see how we have a graph here. When it looks, when it's sad, see how it's sad over here? If I put little smart eyes, you can see the graph is sad over there. And then over here, 
we can see the graph is happy, so it's got a smiley face. See the smiley face there? So when it's smiling, it's concave up. When it's sad, it's concave down. Down, sad, up, happy, okay? So it says, where is the graph concave up? Well, it would be that part over there. So it would be everything to the right-hand side of that point, so you'd say x is bigger than uh, minus one. But now that's not gonna get you four marks. So we have to show this mathematically how we're gonna do all of this, okay? So what we're gonna do first is let's go, let's go, we know that this point here is called your inflection point. And it's to find your inflection point, we should know that that is where your second derivative is equal to zero. So let's go do that. Let's go find the first derivative. That'll be three a x squared plus six x plus b. Then we go find the second derivative, which would then be six a x plus six. Now we're gonna make that equal to zero. But now we already know that this is the inflection point. So we know x is negative one at the point of inflection. So we can go for in a negative one over there. And so we end up with zero is equal to negative six a plus six. Take that over and we end up with a is equal to one. Okay, so we know what the value of a is. So now we can just go back to that second derivative equation that we found, which was six a x plus six, but now we know a is one, so it just becomes six x plus six. And we wanna know where is the second derivative. Okay, when you have concave up, remember we said that that's the smiley face, and that means happy and positive. When you are concave down, then it is um, sad face and negative. Remember, if you're sad, it's a negative situation. If you're happy, it's a positive situation. So we wanna know where it's concave up. So we're gonna make this second derivative bigger than zero. That means positive. If something is bigger than zero, it is positive. And so you could say six x is bigger than negative six. Divide both sides by six and x would be bigger than negative one, and that's what we said earlier already over here. X will be bigger than negative one. If you prefer interval notation, you could say X is an element going from negative one up to infinity. The first thing I wanna show you is that the questions will carry on for this one. So we've got these ones over here, and then we've got this one over here. The graph of the first derivative, remember when they have that, that means the first derivative, okay? first derivative, um, is drawn below. The graph passes through the following points. The first question says, determine the values of m, n, and k. So they just want you to find the equation. Now, remember, from grade 11, we know that there are two different ways to find a parabola equation. One of them would use the x-intercepts, like this, and the other would use turning points, like that. So what have we been given? Well, we've got the two x-intercepts, so we're gonna use this one over here. A Lot of learners forget about the a, don't forget about that, so we're not gonna use this one. Okay, so we're gonna say um, y equals to a, we don't know what that is right now, and now you're gonna go fill in the x-intercept, so this is gonna be x minus one, and then x minus, minus a third. So this actually just becomes x plus a third. Okay, now to, you could go multiply out for now, but what I like to do is, now we need to go find another point to be able to fill in for y and x. So we could use this point over here. So we could say one equals to all of that. You see how I just filled in a one for the y and a, a one for the y and a zero for the x values, okay? Now we can, um, we don't even have to multiply out. Remember that this is just gonna give you negative one. This is just gonna give you a third. So if you multiply these two together, it just gives you negative a third. So what we could then do is go and divide by negative a third and we will end up with a equals to negative three. So a is equal to negative three. So what we then do is we go put that negative three back over here. 
So we now have y equals to negative 3x minus 1, x plus a third. And now what we do is we just go multiply all of this together. So I like to do the two brackets first. So that's going to be um, y equals to negative 3, and then x squared plus a third x minus x minus a third. Then uh, simplify all of that. So that's y equals to negative 3 x squared, okay, now a third minus 1, because remember this is a minus 1 over here, is going to give us negative 2 thirds x minus a third. Then we're going to go multiply the negative 3 in, so that's going to give us negative 3x squared plus 2x plus 1. And now we can see what m, n, and k will be. So it would be m equals to negative 3, n equals to 2, and k equals to 1. Okay, this question over here says, if it is further given that the original graph f of x, not this one, they're talking about the original cubic graph, is equal to that, determine the coordinates of the turning points. Okay, that's an easy one, because we know that to find turning points, you can just make the first derivative, which is actually just this graph. Uh, but let's just go work this out. Minus 3x squared plus 2x plus 1, which is the same as this equation. We just make that equal to 0, right? To find turning points, you make that equal to 0. And so we end up with um, negative 3x squared plus 2x plus 1 equals to 0. And so we can actually... So we can actually get the answer straight from this graph. Where is this graph, which is this one, equal to zero, well that would be at p and at q. But now those are just gonna be the x values of the turning points, the x values of the turning points of the original graph. So we're gonna say negative a third, but now we don't know what the y values are. You can't say the y values are zero because this is on this graph, okay? So, you can imagine if we went and solved this, you would have solved it and you would have got an x equals to negative a third and x equals to 1, um, or x equals to 1. Then you would have to take those x values and go plug them into the original graph to find the y value of those turning points. Okay, so we're going to just say here, there, or uh, there. Now we need to go find those uh, the, y, the y values of those turning points, so I'm going to plug negative a third into here. So I see there's a negative there. Then I put a bracket, and then I put the x value, which is that, like that. And if you go work this out, you end up with 49 over 27. Okay, so that's going to be like that. And then we're going to plug in this x value now, which is a 1. So it's going to be like that, and that'll give us three. Okay, so one and three. So there's the answers for this question. This question for five marks, draw the graph of F. Indicate on your graph the coordinates of the turning points and the intercepts. Okay, so we know that the equation of F is now negative x3 plus x squared plus x plus 2. We already have its turning point, so let's go put that on the graph. So negative a third, and then 49 over 27 is about 1.8. Okay, so it's somewhere here. Uh, so there. Okay, and then 1 and 3. 1 and 3 would be quite high up. It would be like over there, for example. Let's just put this one a bit lower down. Over there. Okay, then we could go and find, so we've, we've got the turning points of this graph. Let's go find the y-intercept. To find the y-intercept, you make x equal to 0. So you make x equal to 0, and that'll give you 2. So the y-intercept will be at 0 and 2, so that would be over here. And then let's just fold these in properly, 1 and 3. And then negative a third and 49 over 27. Okay, so we've got all of that. 
now we need to go and get the x intercepts and this is the part that can take it's a, it's, a, it's the more it's the longer part okay so i'm going to quickly clear up some space here so to find x intercept you make y equal to 0 I'm going to divide everything by negative, so we end up with that being positive, that's negative, that's negative, and that's negative. Now, here is uh, here we are again where we have to try to find x-intercept. So there's so many ways you could do this. You could use synthetic division, or some of you call that block method. You could use the method that I've showed in some of the videos where um, you have to guess the first one. Well, we have to do that for both methods. So let's go do that first. So what I want you to do is I want you to try find a number that you can plug into x that'll make this side equal to zero. I'm gonna try the number x equals to one. So I'm just guessing, to be honest. I'm just gonna guess x equals to one. And let's see what we get. Nope, that doesn't work. Then I'm gonna go plug in x equals to negative one, x equals to negative one. Okay, so now I'm gonna use a bracket. Okay, and that'll give us, okay, that also doesn't work. Then I'm gonna go try the x value of two. So I'm gonna plug in a two over there. And that works, excellent, it gives us a zero. Okay, so x equals to two is our first solution, x equals two. So x equals to two. So if we had to use block method or synthetic division, what you would then do is you would say, um, okay, so x equals to two, you would then do this, and then you would put these coefficients, so one, minus one, minus one, minus two, you would then carry this one down, you would then, this is only for learners who like block method. I will show a different method after this. So you would multiply those two together, which gives you a two. You would then add these numbers together. That would give you a one. You would then multiply those two together, which would give you a two. You would add these together. That would give you a one. You would then multiply these two together. That would give you a two. You would add these together, and that would be zero. What you then do is this would be x3. This was x2. This was x. So for these answers, you're gonna drop each of those by one. So if this was x3, then this would be x2. If this was x2, this would be x, and there we have your answer. x squared plus x plus one. So you're gonna say x squared plus x plus one. And now you need to go solve this one to get two more answers, because we've already got one answer, but because it's a cubic, we need to get three answers. So I don't know if this one actually has any solutions. Let me double check on my calculator quickly. No. So this one you could try factorizing. It wouldn't work. You could try using the quadratic formula and you're going to get an error. So you're just going to say no solution. So this graph only has one x-intercept and that is at 2 and 0. So that's going to be somewhere over here. Oh, for those of you that don't like to use block method, but you prefer to use a different method, let me just show you. So you would still guess your first answer, and you would still end up with x equals to 2. What you would then do is you would put that x equals to 2 in a bracket. So because of that, because it's positive 2, in the bracket you would put it as negative 2. Then here you don't know what these coefficients are, so you just say a plus b plus c. Remember, I've showed this before. Now, the original equation is this one over here. So we know that if you multiply these two, it's gonna give you x to the power of three. And what must the x to the power of threes add up to? Minus one. So that means this would have to be a minus one. What you then do is you look at these two. If you multiply those two, there will be no x's at all. So if you multiply these two, you won't get any x's. So that means it must be this one. So what must this value be so that when you multiply these two, you end up with that? Well, that would have to be a negative one, like that. 
okay? And then to find B, that's the more tricky one, you can decide if you wanna look at the X squares or the Xs. You can choose whichever one you like. I'm gonna look at the X squares, so the number for the X squares must be a one. So if you had to multiply these two brackets together, where would you get X squares? Well, you would get one over there, and then you'd also get it over there. So if you multiply those two, you would get BX squared, and if you had to multiply these two, you would end up with a two. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say bx squared plus two x squared should give us one x squared. I'm then gonna ignore the x squares because that's not the important part right now. And then I can solve for b and I'm gonna get negative one. So my b value is negative one. So I'm gonna put b as negative one over there. And so there we have it. Now I'm just gonna divide this by negative just to make life a little bit easier. So x squared plus x plus one. And there we have the exact same thing that we had earlier. So if we had to go make this equal to zero, we're gonna get no solution again. Okay, and so now we can draw the graph because we have, we have the x-intercept. So the graph's gonna go like this. Then it's gonna reach the turning point. Then it's gonna go, whoopsie, it's gonna go yeah through here. It's gonna turn over there. It's gonna go through, I keep missing that turn, I'm driving too fast. So there, there, turns, and then goes up again. You see, so it never ever cuts the x-axis more than once. Okay, now here's these last questions. So it says points E and W are two variable points on this equation that are on the same horizontal line. So what that means is that they could be like there and there. You see how they're on the same horizontal line? Or maybe it's there and there, as long as they're on the same horizontal line. It says that H is a tangent at E, okay? So let's just quickly pretend that E and W are there. So then H is a tangent, okay? So then H, Graph H would be a tangent, so it would look something like that. So that would be H. And then G is a tangent at W. G is a tangent at W, so like that. H and G intersect at point D, okay? Point D, which has coordinates of A and B. And it says, uh, first question, write down the value of A. I don't know how that's only gonna be one mark. Oh, I think it's because, oh, you know what it is, guys? Because this is a parabola, oh, and be, okay, I understand, I understand. Because it's a parabola, and because we are at the same horizontal level, the tangents are gonna have the same steepness. So there and there, they would actually end up intersecting directly above the turning point, okay? And we know that turning point, we did work it out earlier, I think, what did we say? Oh no, we haven't worked out that turning point yet. Okay, but that won't be difficult to do. So the turning point over here is, um, well, we have the equation of that parabola already. Yeah, I can't remember what the values were that we said. I'll quickly go get them. But we know that the equation of f is equal to, you could even take the midpoint of these two x-intercepts, that also works. But I think it was negative three x squared plus two x plus one. Okay, so to find the turning point, we can just say negative b over two a. And so that's gonna be uh, negative two over two times negative three. And that's gonna give you two over six, which is, a third. Okay, so this x value here is going to be a third, and that would also be the x value for a. So a is going to have a value of a third. Then it says determine the value or values of b. You know why they're saying, oh well, no, I'm not quite sure why they're saying values, but we'll see, which h and g will no longer be, oh, determine the values of b for which h and g will no longer be tangents. Now that's quite a tricky one. 
Um, but let's let's. And I'm not quite sure how we're going to do that one. But let's just have a look at something here. So you see, you see what it looked like when they were tangents, right? Um, and we said that they would intersect somewhere over there. So, but let's say, for example, they weren't tangents. Like let's say it just went um, like that and that you see then they're intersecting at a slightly lower point and if they are not tangents by being wider see then they might intersect at a higher point so yeah it's quite an interesting question let me just draw back the original of what we had so oh no, let's go i think we had something like there okay i'll just change this now and then horizontally across what I'm starting to realize now is that if, okay, so so when it meets above, when it meets above the turning point, then it will be a tan, they can be tangents. So you could even have a scenario where, uh, what were the letters, E and W are there, then you could do tangents and they would meet over there. But, and you could even put the two dots over there and then you draw the tangents and they would meet above. But as soon as you make them meet below, then they can't be tangents. For example, if you have that, and that see then they're not tangents um there and there then they're not tangents you see but if they're meeting above whoops let's just do that a bit better if you can get them to meet above then they are tangents okay so we said that this x value was a third and then this is the b value now, what we should go and do is let's go work out the y value of this point over here. So to do that, you just plug the x value of that turning point into this equation. And that's going to be negative a 3, negative 3, I don't know what I said there, negative a 3. Negative 3 um, plus 2 times a third plus 1. And that'll give us 4 over three, okay? So that's four over three. So if this B value is anything less than that four over three, I'm just thinking about at four over three. If it was at four over three, yeah, then it also, no, then, then, then it would be a tangent because, wait. Yeah, then it could be a tangent because then the lines would be going like that. That is still a tangent. Okay, so if the B value, if this intersection point is anywhere underneath, that point. So if B is anything less than 4 over 3, then those lines will no longer be tangents. For example, if they intersect over here, then they cannot be tangents because then you're going to have something like that. And those aren't tangents. Remember, tangents cannot go through the graph. Tangents must go along the graph. Hey, 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 does this question look familiar? So I've been getting a lot of comments today of people saying how this question nine from the 2022 paper one maths exam that you guys wrote um, has was very difficult for a lot of people. So I'm gonna go through the question with you guys now. What's actually quite interesting is that this question, a similar question was asked in 2017's November paper. Check this out. This is the paper from 2017. We have an equation of y equals to x squared plus two. In, in, in this year's paper, they just used x squared. Then they gave us a point, zero and three, uh, wrong way. <laughs> in this one, they give us the point 10 and 2. And then they ask us for the minimum distance. In the question paper in 2017, they say calculate the distance between Benny when the car is closest to Benny. So that's also a minimum question. So if any one of you went over the 2017 exam paper, you would have enjoyed today's question nine. Well, I'm not going to say today because not everyone watching this is watching it now or when I'm recording this of course so let's let me show you what to do here so what we have is we have some type of graph now it's not that important that you know what the graph looks like but I mean I'll just draw it anyways it's a parabola a very basic looking parabola which just goes like that okay and we have this point 10 and 2 now the point 10 and 2 would be somewhere over here how do I know that it's not there? Well, if you had to plug 10 into this equation, um, the y value would be 100. So that would be like 
um, way up. Well, well, how can I say this? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, how do I say that nicely? So, 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 yeah. The the a ten and one hundred would be somewhere way up here. So the point's going to be somewhere over there. Um, but that's not even that important. Now, what they say is they say determine the minimum distance between the point and a point on F. So we don't know where the point on F is. Maybe it's over here. Okay. And what we'll do is we'll just call it X and Y. Now they've asked us to calculate the minimum distance, so we'll just go get the distance formula um, and we'll make a formula. So I'll use this as my point number two, it doesn't matter, you can do it the other way, and I'll use that as my point number one, and then I'm just gonna say that the distance is gonna be equal to, and then I'm gonna say uh, 10 minus x squared plus two minus y squared, okay? And then what I'm gonna do is, you know when we do optimization in calculus, um, we're not allowed to have two different variables. We need to get rid of one of them. Now, some of you might be like, now, how the heck are we gonna do that? Well, it's quite easy. Um, what we do, um, and I'm sorry I'm saying it's easy, I'm being like that like guy after the test who's like, oh, no, dude, it was so easy. I'm not saying it like that. Um, I'm sorry. So what we'll do is we know that this is an equation over here, and I'm just gonna write it as y equals to x squared. And so that is the, literally the equation that we'll use. By now, some of you are probably like, oh, why didn't I see that in the test? So we have 10 minus x squared plus 2 minus x squared to the power of 2. Okay, now I'm just going to go neaten everything up inside that square root. And so if you had to multiply the brackets out, you're going to get 100 minus 20x plus x squared um, plus 4 minus 4x squared plus x to the power of 4. Um, just want to make sure, 4 minus 4x squared plus x to the power 4. Yes, now here, listen up, ladies and gentlemen. This is the part that would have confused people because you guys know what to do. You guys are like, oh, yeah, dude, I'm just going to take the first derivative now. Um, I just need to take the first derivative because that's how we find minimums and maximums. And you are correct, but what many of you might have sat with in this exam is how do we find the first derivative when you've got a square root. And a lot of you, I know you guys would have done this, you would have put like a power of half, and then you would have been like, bro, like stuff's not working, suddenly you're feeling a bit more sweaty, and I know, hey, I can imagine what would have happened, but here's the little trick. It's a little mathematical trick. Um, you might have to just give this some thought. We cannot take the square root. We cannot use the square root. So what we do is we rather go back to the distance squared. Okay, so we're gonna square the distance, okay? And we're just gonna be left with 100 minus 20x. Actually, I'm just gonna neaten this all up quickly. I'm just gonna put everything together. So it's gonna give us x to the power of four. So I'm taking the square, I just took the square root away. And then the x squares would give us negative three x squared um, minus 20x plus 104. Now here's the key. You don't have to take the first derivative of the distance to find out the minimum distance. You can actually just take the first derivative of the distance squared because it will still give us the same place. If you minimize d, that is the same place where you would also minimize d squared. Okay, for example, if the minimum, uh, yeah, I don't want to go too much into that because that you might just have to think about that by yourself. But if you, fi if you find the place where the D is a minimum, like if you find the X and Y where the D is a minimum, that will also be the X and Y where the D squared is a minimum. Okay, that's the part that's a little bit interesting here. That when you, you can, min you can minimize D, but you can also minimize D squared and it will be the exact same area, okay? So I don't have to go take the first derivative um, of this part. I can actually just go take the first derivative of this part. So um, I'm going to use the correct notation. So we're going to take the derivative. So it's the derivative of d squared, okay, over the variable x. If you did this in the test um, to the power, like with a little one over there to show that you're taking the first derivative, um, they might accept that as well. Or maybe you could have done it like this, d2 with a little line over there. Okay, so we're gonna take the first derivative of that and that's gonna give us 4x3 minus 6x minus 20. All right, and now we know that if you wanna find the minimum, you have to make that equal to zero. So you have to make your first derivative equal to zero. So we're gonna say, um, 
zero is equal to four. Actually, let me write this somewhere else. I'm going to take it up here now. So we're going to say zero is equal to four x cubed minus six x minus 20. And now suddenly we have to do the whole cubic, how to find the x values of a cubic graph. Now this is where some of you would use synthetic division um, and all of those types of things. But if you've ever watched my videos, then I usually don't use synthetic division. What I like to do is I like to, um, you keep plugging in x values until you keep plugging x values into here until you end up with a zero. So you might try x equals to one, and if you try x equals to one, then you're gonna end up getting um, four minus six, you're gonna end up getting like minus 22, I think. Yeah, so that doesn't work. Then if you try x equals to two, then you actually end up getting a zero. If you plug a two into all of the x values, you end up getting a zero. And so, um, so if you've watched those videos on how to do that, then you would know that we can now make a bracket and, you, and you'd be left with x minus two. And then we'd be left with a x squared. It's that stuff. It's this stuff. Hey guys, I hope I hope this is making sense now. I know a lot of you watching this right now might feel a little frustrated. Um, it's normal. I've I remember coming out of my own exams, and it can be a bit irritating. Okay, now we got to do that whole method where you got to try find the value of a, b, and c. Okay, and so everyone has their own way of doing this, but if you look here, the x cubes, they must eventually add up to four. So that means that this a value is a four. And then if you had to multiply these two together, it should give you negative 20. So that means that this part here would be positive 10. And then we need to find the b value. And that's usually the one that learners struggle with. So what I've said in my previous videos on this is, um, oh, what, what am I doing? Sorry. Um, so what, I, what I've said in previous videos is that you either going to try and make all the x's equal minus 6, or normally we would look at the x squares, but there are no x squares, so we'll just leave that out. So we're going to try get the b value by looking at all of the x's, and we hope that all of the x's can be negative 6. Um, so you're going to say negative 6 equals. Now where are we going to get x's? Well, you're going to get an x when you multiply this one and that one, so that's going to give you 10 x. You can say x if you want. And then if you multiply this one and this one, so that's going to give you minus 2b. You might have your own way of getting this x, this b value, okay? Everyone, like there's lots of different ways. Now, if I had to get x by itself, I mean b by itself, sorry, you end up with 16 like that. And then you just ignore the x's and you'd end up with b equals to 8. Okay, so b is going to be 8, so I'll put that over there. All right. And then, okay, so now what we have is this. And now this is the part where you would now have to try find all the other x values. So we already know this one is x equals to 2. And then you could put this one in the quadratic formula. But what you would find is that when you try to solve this one in the quadratic formula, it actually gives you an error. So the only answer can only be that one. So x is equal to 2. Now that's not the final answer. That's just the x value. So we know the x value um, at this point now. It's 2. Now to find the y value, we can just use this equation over here. So the y value will be two to the power of two, which is four. So we've got that now. And now we can just go find the distance between uh, the two points because we now have all the coordinates. We didn't even have to find the y value to be honest because we can actually just go plug the x value into here. Or if you want to, you can just use the distance formula between the two and the four and the 10 and the two. You can do whatever you want at this point. Um, but if we have to go work that out, I'm just gonna plug it into here. So x is two. And if you do this, you should get a final answer of two to the square root 17. But if we round that to two decimal places, then d would be equal to eight comma two five. Let me write that a little bit better, eight comma two five. A, B, and C are three events. The probabilities of these events occurring is given in the Venn diagram below. If it is given that the probability that at least one of the events will occur is 0 0.893, calculate the value of Y. The probability that none of the events will occur. Okay, so if it is given that the probability that at least one of the events would occur, then what is the probability that none of the events would occur? Okay, well, 
you could just say 1 minus 0 0.893 and that'll give us 0 0.107. Now work out this one over here, which says, because remember, if all of we know that all of this here adds up to 1. All of that adds up to 1, everything. So if this stuff over here is 0 0.893, then this one would be 1 minus that, okay? Now it says, what is the value of x, the probability that all three events would occur? Well, this is easy because we know that all of these add up to 0 0.893. So you could just say 0 0.893 minus this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. And I'm going to quickly go do that. So I'm going to say 0 0.893 minus all of those. And that'll be 0 0.16. So that's 0 0.16. This question says, determine the probability that at least two of the events will take place. Well, what is at least two? At least two. That means two or more. So where are the places where two or more? Well, I know that this part here is when A and C are taking place together, so we will include that. I know that this part here is when C and B are happening together, so we'll take that. I know that this part here is when A and B are taking place together, so we will include that. And we will also include when all three, because it said at least two. So it's two or more. So you would add all of those together, so that would be 0 0.15 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 plus x, which we calculated as 0 0.16, and this will give us 0 0.61, 0 0.61. The last one says, are events B and C independent? Justify your answer. Okay, so we've got a formula for independent, right? The independent formula goes like this. So if two events, let's call them B and C, are independent, then the following formula is true. P of A and B is the same, sorry, we said B and C, didn't we? B is equal to P of B multiplied by P of C. So this formula is only true if the events are independent. So we cannot say that they are equal right now because we don't know. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this as part number one and I'm going to look at this as part number two. I'm going to go find part number one. Then I'll go find part number two and I will see if these two things are equal. If they are, then I'll say they are independent. Now this is very easy, check this out. B and C, so where do B and C overlap? Well, that would be all of this. I know some of you are like, yeah, but Kevin, that's also A. I know that, but they didn't say and not A. When they say B and C overlap, they're talking about those two parts over there, okay? So that's gonna be 0 0.2 plus whatever we got for x, which was 0 0.16, and that's going to be 0 0.36. Okay, now we're going to go do this. Now, when they say p of b, they mean the whole of b. So that's the whole of b, okay? So that's going to be, um, well, let's just quickly say here, uh, p of b would be 0 0.16 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.183 plus 0 0.2. And that's going to be 0 0.643, 0 0.643. Then the P of C, so that's the whole of C, would be all of that. And so that's going to be 0 0.16 plus 0 0.2 plus 0 0.05 plus 0 0.15. And that'll give us 0 0.56. We're then going to multiply those two values together. And that'll give us 0 0.56. 3, 6. So these two values are equal, therefore, yes, they are independent. I've actually never, I've hardly ever seen a question where they actually end up being independent. A four-digit code, okay, let's write that down, a four-digit code, is required to open a combination lock. The code must be even numbered. Okay, that means it must end with an even number over here. Remember, when they say even numbered, it doesn't mean that every number must be even. It only means the last one must be even. For example, this number 
is even. Why? Because that number's even. This number over here, 7, 9, 1, 6, is even because that number is even. So when something is even, it means the last digit is even. They also tell us must not contain the 0 or 1. Okay, so we're only using the numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And the digits may not be repeated. Okay, first question. How many four-digit combinations are there to open the lock? Okay, so you start with the biggest restriction. The biggest restriction is that it must be even numbered. So how many different numbers could we have there? Well, you could have a 2, a 4, a 6, or an eight. So that's four different options that we will put over there. Now let's say for example that it was a two that we chose. Okay, so that's now gone. So then for the rest of it, how many numbers could you choose over here? Well, you've still got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's say for example, we chose a three. Now you've, we're not allowed to repeat the digits. So now we only have six numbers available. Let's say we chose the eight and now we only have one, two, um, one, two, three, four, five options available. Go ahead and we multiply all of those different options and we get an answer of 840. Okay, now, that is this question. Now we're gonna move on to question 10.2.2. So let's just quickly see the numbers we have again, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. This one says, calculate the probability that you will open the lock at the first attempt if it is given that the code is greater than 5,000. Okay, and the third digit is a two. All right, so if the third digit is a two, then we know that this one has to be a two. So there's only one way we can choose that one. There is only one number you can choose there. You cannot choose three or four numbers. You can only choose one number there. Then the number has to be greater than 5,000. So how do you make a number greater than 5,000? Well, it means that this first number could either be a five, a six, a seven, a eight, or a nine. Because if you had to put a four, if, you're, if you have a code that starts with a four, like four, six, one, two, that's smaller than 5,000. If you have a number that starts with a three, three, one, eight, nine, or sorry, three, two, that's smaller than 5,000. So your number has to be a five, a six, a seven, an eight, or a nine for the first digit. But there is a little bit of a catch with this one. Because you might be tempted to say, okay, well, there's five different numbers we could choose from. So let's just put a five there. But that's not correct. The reason is it makes a difference whether you choose an even number or an odd number in the beginning here. Let me explain. If you choose, if you had to, for example, choose a six over here, let's say you had the number six, then when you're looking at the number of even numbers that you have, well, then all of a sudden there's only the number eight available or the number, sorry, there's also the number four. So you'd only have two options over here. But if you chose, let's say you chose the number five for this first position, well, then you still have a four, an eight and a six. So then you would have a three available over there. So it makes a big difference whether we choose an odd number in the front here or an even number. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make two scenarios. We're gonna say odd and even number or odd number for position one. So that could be the number five, seven or nine. And then you could have an even number for position one. And that would be numbers like uh, six, or eight, because remember the first number has to be larger than five or more to make it larger than 5,000. Okay, so for this first position, for this first position, we we then have three options, okay? So let's say for example, we chose, let's say we chose a, um, let's say we chose a five. Then for this position over here, you would have, or let's now go to this position. For this position here, we now have a four, six and an eight. So we have three options there. Let's say we chose a six. So now for this last, well, this position, we have one, two, three, four, five, like that. Go ahead, multiply all of those, and that'll give us 45. 
Then for this one, for the first position, we could choose either a six or an eight. So that's two different positions. So let's say, for example, we chose, uh, let me just get rid of all of this. Let's say we chose a six. Then for this even number position, we either have a four or an eight available. So it's a two over there. Let's say we chose a four. Now for the rest, we still have one, two, three, four, five options available. Go ahead, multiply all of those, and that'll give us 20. Add these two together, that gives you 65. Now they said, what is the probability? So you're gonna say 65 divided by the total available, which is 840, and if you do that, you end up with a fraction of 13 over 168.